Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the second of three regional virtual meetings for regions one through four. Uh, we're excited to have you here. Welcome back if this is your second meeting, uh, and if it's your first, welcome. Uh, we are looking forward to an exciting presentation today revolving around helping TANF clients to achieve long-term goals. I want to run through just a few housekeeping items. I apologize for those of you who may have seen this previously, uh, but we do have some new folks, so I want to make sure that everybody is working from the same information. So Bizabo is the uh, host platform for all of the meetings. It's where we will house the agenda, speaker information, and session materials. Uh, so at any point during the meeting or after the meeting, you can click on sessions in the agenda to find out additional information about all of our wonderful speakers. Uh, and you can also access session materials, PowerPoints, and other resources that might be available. Uh, we'll also provide a way for you to access the, those materials through the chat box uh, later today as well if you are having any issues joining through Bizabo. The main meeting, as you all know, is being hosted in Zoom. Uh, I think we're all fairly familiar with Zoom at this point. Uh, for the most part, folks will be muted, so we want you to encourage, we want to encourage you to submit any questions you have through the chat box. That would be for any of the presenters or if you need any assistance uh, or have any questions or want to suggest resources that might be of use to other participants. This is an ongoing dialogue that we'll be having in the chat box and look forward to your participation there. There'll also be some polls and uh, that appear during the question to get during the presentation to get some of your input and we'll do a an evaluation survey at the end to get your feedback on the session uh that's it for me i'm going to turn it over to eileen to kick us off eileen thank you steve um good morning everybody this is eileen friedman i'm the regional program manager in region three philadelphia for tanif um, I know we're all East Coasters today. I hope you're all enjoying this very spring-like day we're having. I was actually tempted to go out on the deck and have the meeting. Um, this session that we're going to have now, we think is very important. When we were first planning the meeting, we talked about um, the impact that our, our families have when they're no longer eligible for assistance, because as you know, most families, once they get a minimum wage job, they're no longer eligible for assistance. So they become the working poor. So what happens to these families? So hopefully this session um, is going to um, work, see what paths are available to people to get them on another pathway and enhance their skills so that they become financially independent. So um, the moderator today, who's gonna to kick things off for us is um, Ed Trumbull. Um, Ed is known for creating impactful workforce solutions and conducting insightful analysis. And during his 30 years public and private sector career, he served as an executive advising a Maryland governor on education reform and workforce innovation, staffed Maryland's Workforce Development Board, led a local workforce development board, providing consulting services for the leadership of the U.S. Departments of Labor and Commerce, and served as an executive of several national workforce organizations and it sounds like you couldn't keep a job for very long. <laughs> the very um, employment rich history, Eileen. <laughs> <laughs> he is currently leading several US Department of Labor funded disasters recovery and workforce innovation initiatives. So I'll turn it over to Ed and I hope you enjoy this session. Thank you. Absolutely. Eileen, thank you for that very generous introduction. And uh, Steve, thank you for convening and kicking off today's meeting. Um, I have the pleasure of moderating a panel, How We Built This, Helping TANF Clients Succeed Long-Term. And I'm just going to give you a quick blurb. In this session, participants will hear from organizations across the country how they built their programs to focus on strategies that foster client success. So today's workshop is modeled after National Public Radio's How I Built This with Guy Ross. And participants will be immersed in what it takes to achieve long-term success. 
And we're really delighted to have five excellent presenters. Um, as Steve pointed out, that bios are available um, in the materials along with the agenda, speaker information, session materials. So without further ado, our first um, panelist is Joe Jones, the founder and president and CEO of the Center for Urban Families. Joe, if you'd be so kind. Yeah, Ed, well, thank you for that generous introduction, and it's so great to be with the ACF Regional Families. I'm Joe Jones, founder and CEO of the Center for Urban Families, an organization I founded in 1999 after working in maternal and child health at the Baltimore City Health Department. And that's instructive for our conversation today uh, because so many of the women who uh, received services then were, uh, were TANF recipients. And they were also in relationship with men who they happened to have children by. And it was very uh, challenging for a public health system to think about father engagement as it related to serving uh, women who receive in public benefits. Uh, when we started the organization, and I want to be you know, blatantly honest about what I think we needed to change. We engage uh, adults age 18 and above, both men and women, uh, in an organization where the mission is to strengthen urban communities by helping fathers and families achieve uh, economic success. Our mantra is to dismantle poverty. That's today's mantra, and, and it, that'll be instructive for me to come back to. Our strategy around dismantling poverty is what we call all in. And all in is our strategy to accelerate social and economic opportunity and advocate for policies that, that promote equity uh, and racial justice. But to take a step back, and this is where it's I had to be painfully honest to myself and with you all, we provided uh, supports uh, in two domains, family strengthening, and fa engaging fathers, and working with couples uh, who were in intact relationships. Many of them are receiving public benefits, but they may not have resided together. And then secondly, economic supports to help people get into the labor force who had relatively high barriers to labor force attachment. And as we were working with them, we considered that we were successful, and by U.S. Department of Labor standards, we were successful in getting people into the labor market. But the reality of it is the wages that they were earning were not family sustaining wages. Uh, they did not propel them above the poverty line. And that became a source of frustration. But we also noticed that some incredible things were happening with some of our, we, we refer to our clients as members. Uh, uh, some incredible things were happening with some of our members in terms of their economic trajectory. They had gotten above poverty. They weren't toggling back and forth. And they were uh, in careers, some had become homeowners, and even some had become entrepreneurs. And we decided to look at a, uh, a large data set of the folks we had uh, engaged who presented at the Center for Services, and we wanted to see what did they present with the most. And what we found was a set of what we call self-sufficiency uh, dimensions that often were the things that they presented with. And these were, uh, these were focused on uh, uh, child care, workforce attachment, uh, financial capability, transportation, legal, child support, behavioral health, and education and training and safety. And we decided that we wanted to measure how a person moved along a trajectory, a trajectory of being uh, in crisis, moving along uh, towards thriving during their time with us. And when we did this uh, analysis of our data, and we then did qualitative interviews with folks who were really successful, but who were very challenged and economically fragile when they joined us. We found that we had built in a set of informal supports that was uh, over the course of three to five years. And what we decided to do relative to dismantling poverty in that mantra was to say no longer will we fabricate or a microwave story where someone with high barriers could come in in six months into a year and get to economic self-sufficiency. They would have to be with us over the long haul. We asked them not to consider joining us to go to a program, but to join us to go on a journey over the course of that three to five years. What was um, challenging was that the case management necessary to support that journey, the funding that we received did not equate to the level of support 
relative to case management capacity. So we had to reorient our thinking with our donors and funders to ask them to invest in our strategy, not into an organization. And it took a few years, uh, beginning in 2019, when we implemented our all-in strategy, to get donors to begin to reorient their thinking and to help us to think through what uh, was necessary to help people move along that journey. And uh, Steve, if you could pull up this slide. And we also had to be realistic about how do we, uh, think about this in the context of community. So this is a child support uh, slide relative to Baltimore. So the map is of Baltimore and the pop-ups are certain zip codes. The red dot in the middle is where CFUF is located in zip code 21217. And if you'll see uh, in that zip code, uh, we have uh, 1,700 non-custodial parents who owe an aggregate of $27 million uh, whose uh, the poverty rate in that zip code is what it is along with the incarceration rate. This represents what I call a triple threat. And for us, we had to do, we had to think about serving the families, the individuals we serve, including women uh, or, or, or parents who were receiving TANF benefits to understand we had to deal with this in the context of what was happening in the community and provide the requisite level of support, expand our service delivery to include whole families, multi-generational families, and then to think about a set of policy considerations. Uh, these policy considerations around what was mentioned earlier, the benefits cliff. People who get into the labor force uh, who receive uh, TANF benefits, having those benefits abruptly uh, reduced or eliminated. Uh, we needed to think about advocacy for the expansion of the earned income tax credit for childless workers, for those folks who are in that social network with those TANF moms or TANF parents, and child support pass-through so that when child support is being paid, it actually gets to the family as opposed to going to the coffers of the state. And for us, those are a collateral set of supports that are absolutely necessary for us to help TANF clients achieve what we call family sustaining wages, to get above the poverty line, not to toggle uh, back and forth, and to think about the assets that these uh, parents have if they're receiving TANF. What we believe is the skills that they have to negotiate the TANF system, from negotiating with a caseworker or the system, to navigating that system, facilitating other family members to negotiate that system, we think are some of the uh, attributes of a transferable set of skills to get, actually get into the labor force and perform. And so to think about what it means to engage other stakeholders, including our partners uh, in the public uh, work system and the community college, uh, where we are able to help people navigate those systems, access those resources without incurring or accruing additional debt so that they can move along this journey to economic self-sufficiency. And I look forward to the rest of the conversation. Joe, thank you for that excellent overview. And um, at this point, uh, I'd like to invite Brandy Yanka. Brandy is the Executive Vice President of Connections to Success. Brandy, if you'd be so kind. Sure. Um, thank you all for having me today and the opportunity to share more about the economic mobility model that we have at Connections to Success. Um, just a little back history. I, I agree with a lot of what Joe just said. You're a tough act to follow, Joe. Um, but we were started in 1998 in St. Louis. And in the 23 years the organization's been in existence, we've really been looking at how do we best serve the families that come through our doors every day and have developed an economic mobility model that's now in six locations um, throughout Illinois, Kansas, and Missouri. And we're also partnering with other organizations in seven states. So we've really um, looked at what's worked and what hasn't worked and at our data as well. And I think one of the biggest pieces, um, connections, and as Joe mentioned, that case management is so important. And so we really look at the individuals who come through our doors and ask them, ask them to be engaged with us for, for at least 12 months, but let them know our engagement is lifelong because you don't, you don't get to that living wage in 90 days or six months or 12 months. So we're here with individuals that we serve for the long haul. So it gets messy at times because of that, um, but we really value that and have seen the families that we've worked with really um, break those barriers, break that generational cycle of poverty, incarceration, and domestic violence, and start really building a future for their children. So um, what it really starts with is creating a sense of community. So when someone comes into our offices, it's very much um, an inclusive culture, if you will. We don't care um, 
any given day or what, if we have a gratitude circle, we start every morning with in all of our locations focusing on gratitude. It really sets the tone for all of the services that we deliver. So you could be delivering a package to our office or one of our big donors or participant or staff and you're all participating together in the morning, focusing on that gratitude. And our economic mobility model, then those who are there receiving our services, engage in what we call our personal and professional development class. And it's a 60 hour training this cohort base that really gets um, the men and women that we serve that come through our doors, really focusing on how to find a job, how to keep a job, but also how to build their social capital. Who is within your network? Um, who, who is it that we could connect them to from our own network for employment opportunities, for additional support? And that real strong piece of what's that expansion of connections to success in our team? Who do we have in our community? Who are our volunteers? Who are our mentors? That we can connect the, the participants that we're serving with to really reach um, other, other jobs that may have been out of reach of context, so they don't have transportation. How can we get them connected to individuals that can get them to jobs that maybe aren't on a bus line? That's a big piece that we really wanna focus on with, with those that we serve. And we have that belief that everyone matters. Um, so it's about what each individual wants. So there is a process at Connections with our training, we have coaching, which we call life transformation coaching with our mentoring, but it's very individualized for the, for the individuals that we serve and helping to develop their plans and their goals and how do they achieve economic independence. So they develop a life plan um, in key areas of their life and our coaches really help them connect to other community resources, connecting, um, if they might need assistance with health care, that's something we don't do, but we have community partners that will leverage to provide that support to them. Maybe before they need that job, um, they have to take care of those types of things. So we really are um, focused on leveraging our partnerships, helping the individual be um, the, the creator of their own journey. It is a journey, but we want them to help guide us and we'll help guide them along the way with the resources that they need. Um, it's really about that creating that space that co-creating and that learning space is super important for us so they can feel safe to share, this is what I dream of doing. And we're here to help them figure out how to achieve those goals. It might be going back to school. It might be, again, connected to those social capital networks. How do they find other individuals that they can connect with to help them provide that pro-social support, to be there to help them navigate bad days, but also to celebrate the good news and the good days. That's really important. Um, they, we also focus on healthy relationships, on motherhood and fatherhood and co-parenting. How does that translate into communication for them and their families and to keep that relationship with their child, really to break that cycle for the next generation and with that child's um, other parent is a big piece. Um, we also have a professional women's group. So it's really designed to be a um, job retention program. Once someone receives a job, and we do this for the guys too, we do have a professional men's group. Um, but where they can come to receive additional support and leadership and our goal and what we've seen happen over these past 23 years is that individuals in our programs are now leading those groups. They're, we're there in, the, in the, the, the behind the scenes helping them maybe get connected to a, a speaker, but they're saying, hey, we want to have more information here, but they're really leading and empowering each other. And that's our goal is to really get them to empower those others. Um, to come to those professional women's group and men's groups and say, hey, like my employer is hiring. Let's get you connected. And they start leveraging the, their own networks. That's a really, um, it's a beautiful thing to see happen when they're connecting and they're sharing their stories and they're sharing their networks. Um, we have partnerships also with community colleges, with tra technical training schools, with child support and with the Department of Social Services to help them address those barriers that might be holding them back. So we bring in um, speakers from child support to work with the, the individuals that may owe child support and how they can help get on that payment plan to get that going. And if they need, need help navigating all of those services, we have those partnerships in place. We have a community college who is providing skill-based training programs for our participants to get them those industry recognized credentials to get onto a career pathway. So really, again, like I shared, it's very individualized about what does an individual want? How do they see their life unfolding? And how do we just be that connector? That's simply what we're doing is connecting those individuals to resources in the community. Um, I know we have a couple minutes left, so there's a video that highlights a little bit more about our work. So Steve, if you could roll that now, that would be great.
So I don't know, do we have any of those? At Connections, we do have an economic mobility model that we know that works and that's evidence-based that pays back into healthy communities. All these different partnerships and collaborations, that's what's going to stop the violence and disrupt that cycle of poverty. I was that person. I was also that person who battled homelessness. I was also that person escaping things and being a single parent at one point of time in my life. I'm trying to be the person that I needed. I get to really, really help people. They know that they are loved, regardless of the situation. I think that is what I need people to walk out with. And there's nothing better than success and seeing a life transformed and know that you had something to do with it. Change can happen, it does happen. We see it happen every day. That's what gets me up every day. To see the people reaching those milestones and the dreams they have for themselves and their children. Randy, thank you very much thank for you. not only your video, but also your very thorough description. And um, at this point in time, we're delighted to welcome our next presenter, Dr. Marianne Chilton, who is the director of Building Wealth and Health uh, Network Program at Drexel. And uh, Marianne, if you'd be so, uh, so um, welcome us with your remarks, that would be terrific. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Marianne Chilton. And I'm the founder of the Building Wealth and Health Network. I also run the Center for Hunger-Free Communities at Drexel University in Philadelphia, uh, located on the original lands of the Leni Lenape peoples. Um, the Building Wealth and Health Network is a healing-centered peer support program that helps TANF participants build their wealth and improve their health. And I just want to send a big thanks out to Eileen Friedman of Region 3 and her colleagues there also the state TANF directors that allowed us to uh, and encouraged us and, and advised us to create this program um, and to be supportive in the background. We really appreciate it. So we built the Building Wealth, Health, Building Wealth and Health Network, which we call the network for short, based off of empirical evidence and in my empirical work on food insecurity and hunger. Um, what we were learning from people who participate in SNAP and TANF programs and also people who've experienced hunger and poverty firsthand uh, are three main things. First of all, the majority of people that we were working with had been exposed to violence and trauma in their homes um, and in their communities and were really struggling with major mental health uh, challenges. And the trauma comes not just from potentially in the home, but also there's intergenerational violence, um, massive injustices over generations, really since the founding of this country, um, as well as the violence and trauma in everyday society, uh, racism in our schools, racism by uh, uh, being mistreated by police or being mistreated on the street, um, experiencing racism in housing and healthcare, and also just structural racism pretty much on all different types of through all different types of systems where people are shut out of opportunities. Um, that's also related to major social isolation and financial isolation. Um, the third thing that we learned is that uh, the people we were talking to were incredibly resilient and very brilliant and had lots of beautiful ideas about what they could achieve, what could they, they could do in the world if only they were given an opportunity. So um, what we learned and what we sought out to do was to not create a program that sought to control people or to tell people what to do, but actually to flip the power dynamic. Um, in order to do that, we wanted to make sure that we could tap into people's resilience and creativity and that they could actually share resources among themselves um, and into resources that they maybe had not been encouraged to tap into. Uh, so we were seeking to get less power in the hands of caseworkers and less power into the hands of the state, more power into the hands and hearts and wallets of people who are poor. 
So how did we do this? We did not focus on work or work participation, which is why I think the major shout out of gratitude to uh, Region 3 for allowing us to um, change the focus, change, get it out of the work participation rate. And we know that that is a major stressor. And I hope we can maybe talk about that later in the question and answer. So in our program, in the network, we focus on wealth and health. So by wealth, we mean we focused on people's personal financial goals. Uh, it's a broader way of understanding income. It's not just about getting a job or, you know, holding down the job. It's also about thinking about savings. How do you prepare for the inevitable, inevitable emergency? How do you save for purchasing a home? The other thing that we focused on was hold out for the better paying job. And when you take that job, negotiate for higher wages. So we sought to have people think about a job, not just as a job, but as a really an important source of baseline income and a well-paying job at that. Thirdly, we help people focus on entrepreneurship. The uh, vast majority of people that we uh, have been working with are very resilient and um, knit or crochet on the side or sell pies off, off of their front porch. They're entrepreneurs. So we wanted people to recognize their own uh, ability to be an entrepreneur, to be a CEO, and to actually be um, someone who creates jobs. That's the wealth side. On health, we wanted people to really have a, a place for social connection, which helps to treat that social isolation. Um, and to explore concepts of healing and wellness. Uh, and so we use a trauma-informed approach built, um, adapted from the sanctuary model. And in our uh, things that you're downloading, you can read more about it. I'd like to turn it over to you, Steve, to, I'm gonna give it over to uh, Kevin Thomas, who's one of the co-directors of our program. And Kevin describes the, uh, the program in a, in, a very, in a very different way than I just described it. And this was our, this is our this recruitment is our uh, commercial, we call it. So the first thing to know about the network is we're not just another program. And we get it. There's always a new program or a new thing happening at the Earn Centers. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it isn't. We're not that. The Building Wealth and Health Network is an opportunity to build connections, reflect and analyze your journey, address any trauma that's been holding you back, and organize a way forward, all while growing your bank account. So how do we do all of that? The network breaks down like this. There's 16 self-empowerment financial sessions where we combine financial literacy with resilience-based healing center life coaching. You can't separate money from life, so teaching one without teaching the other doesn't make much sense. Outside of classes, members have access to one-on-one -on -one support from coaches. Some financial matters are gonna take time to fix, and some traumas will too. So meet with your coaches privately as much as you like. And then there's our Matt Savings account in which you can earn cash for making deposits and coming to class. We also incentivize you for going after your goals in class so there's opportunity to earn even more. While our members have told us that our program is fun, make no mistake about it, we dig deep. <laughs> we solve problems and most of all, we support each other. Too often we're forced to handle things alone. We're the only person that we trust and the only person we feel we can turn to. And that isolation and all of that stress slowly breaks us down. We're all out here just trying to build a good life for ourselves and our kids, so why do we do it alone? Why not connect and do it together? Why can't we grow, learn, and save with a bunch of like-minded people who've gone through the same things we have? Believe it or not, we're out here, and we're waiting for you to join us. This isn't just another program. This is the network. My power, my money. So we, we know we've been working with TANF participants for many years, and um, we know that, that sometimes they're just kind of tired of cycling back into TANF and yet another program. And we sought to really distinguish our program from others, and people recognize it and know it. Um, we created this also we, when we got started back in 2014. We started out as a randomized controlled trial. And what we did is we compared people who are in our program, we call them members as well, um, we compared them to people who were in standard education and training programs uh, throughout the city of Philadelphia. And when we compared them both, we found out that 
The people that we worked with took a little bit longer to get into the workforce, but they were far more likely to stay in the workforce and earn higher wages, and they were less likely to return to TANF. So we didn't focus on work participation rate. What we focused on was, again, wealth and health. That actually was quite successful in terms of employment. The second area that we found major improvements are in our on economic security. That's food security, housing, and housing security, and utility security. And the third uh, dimension was mental health. Major improvements in mental health, much less anxiety, and actually less substance use. So um, in the materials, you can, you can download those, check out our website. Uh, please feel free to reach out to learn more about our program. Um, it's evidence-based and it's fun and it's deep. Thank you very much for having me. I look forward to the discussion. Excellent, Mariana. thank you very much. Uh, that was a very impressive overview. And at this point, it's uh, our pleasure to introduce Nicole Tilka, Nicole is the Assistant Director for the Utah Department of Workforce Services. Nicole? Thanks, Ed. Um, so over the last few years in the state of Utah, we've had a focus on assisting families experiencing intergenerational poverty. Uh, we've published annual reports, conducted research, and looked at specific strategies for helping families. As part of this focus, we have targeted efforts with TANF recipients. One of the projects that we have been engaging in is our Invest in You programs. So the Invest in You program is a partnership with industry, education, and our department. The program combines technical education, essential employment skills training, executive functioning, and family classes. The technical education is developed in collaboration with employers and the education providers. Sometimes the technical education is provided by a community college, a tech college, or the employer. The education program is tailored to meet specific industry needs. Um, so, so far we've had three programs across the state in both rural and urban areas in three different occupation areas, uh, medical device manufacturing, medical assisting, and nutraceuticals. We, poke, we selected these programs um, based off of partnerships we had with employers that had a little higher starting wage as well as the opportunity for advancement and growth. Um, so the essential employment skills portion of the training includes topics such as how to work with coworkers in a team setting, resume writing, networking, as well as looking for advancement opportunities. The executive functioning skills portion of the training comes from presentations on various topics, modeling, one-on-one -on -one coaching with participants, as well as the classroom expectations. Um, so with the executive functioning, staff model those skills and they talk through those skills with participants. Class members also learn about certain skills and then they work in groups to prepare presentations for the class where they teach them on that topic. Uh, this helps them not only learn a skill but practice creating a plan, managing their time, as well as organizing their thoughts. Uh, employment counselors help coach participants through life circumstances as they come up uh, to help them with the application of executive functioning. So as an example, it's expected that participants show up to a class on time. If they don't, the counselor will uh, pull them aside and talk with them through what happened and help the participant kind of think through what could help them in the future avoid being late to class so that they're kind of able to practice some of those ex executive functioning skills. Uh, the Invest in You program includes a holistic family support approach to help participants' families be in a place where they will have a higher chance for success. Once a week, families meet together in the evening for group learning and activities. The kids and parents are engaged in hands-on activities as part of this. Some topics include household rulemaking, meal planning and nutrition, as well as family budgeting. We also have an on-site clinician that assists in running the group activities, and they're also available for individual counseling if participants need it. 
the structure of the Invest in You programs um, is a cohort model, and we do this uh, so that they are able to grow their social capital and learn from each other. We've really seen that participants become very close and that they're able to help and support each other through the training program as well as after it's completed. With the Invest in You program, uh, before participants enter the program, they attend a workshop to learn more about the occupation. And if they're interested, after the workshop's over, they're invited to an interview. So as part of that interview, it's a little different than maybe a typical interview. We really try and ask a series of interview questions to help identify if that program is a good fit for the participant. The questions are often tied to the occupation that they would be going into at the end of the program. So as an example, with medical device manufacturing, you're required to work in a clean environment. So as part of that interview process, we ask participants questions to see if they would be okay working in a clean environment and if that's something they're willing to do. Um, after participants have graduated from the Invest in You program, we continue to follow up with them for a year to 18 months, just depending on what their individual family needs may be. Uh, during that time, we can provide employment counseling, supportive service funding, and child care assistance to continue to help them as they become uh, self-sufficient. Uh, one of the really great benefits of the program is the buy-in we've seen from employers that we've become engaged with. Uh, we've had employers that have really invested into participants in the program. They've provided graduation gifts. Um, they've also really helped us to smooth out the hiring process. And they have provided on-site tours um, during the program. Additionally, we have some other supports and services outside of the Invest in You program for TANF recipients. Uh, one of those is the Transitional Cast Assistance Program. So when an individual's TANF case closes due to employment, they can continue to receive uh, assistance for three months. That includes cash assistance, child care, and continued case management services. We really found that this helps uh, participants have additional stability as they move off of TANF assistance and towards self-sufficiency. Also, for all participants that are exiting TANF, they're eligible for what we call extended services, which allows case management services for up to 18 months after exit. This helps those families that need additional assistance as they're transitioning off benefits and to ensure that they have a help and support system from us as they kind of transition off of benefits assistance. So these are just some of the things that we're doing in the state of Utah to help our TANF recipients as they transition off of benefits. Nicole, excellent. Thank you very, very much for that very in-depth discussion about Invest in You. And now it's our pleasure to introduce Aaron Olikin. And Aaron is the director of the Vermont Reach Up program, which is the TANF program in the great state of Vermont. Um, Aaron, if you'd be um, if you'd be willing to share with us a little bit about your program, that'd be wonderful. Yes, thanks, Ed. Um, so, um, Reach Up is the uh, TANF program in Vermont, and uh, we've been working um, over the last few years on transitioning Reach Up from a program that is extremely rule oriented and focused on the work requirement to transitioning to a coaching model um, and really um, working on, we developed a mission and a vision for the program um, it, a few years ago in collaboration with our community partners and participants and staff. And so our mission uh, for Reach Up is that Reach Up joins families on their journey to overcome obstacles, explore opportunities, improve their finances, and reach their goals. And so this is really important to us because we go back to this mission to root ourselves in what, what other programs, what kinds of services and opportunities do we want to make sure that participants in our program have access to. And that brings us to um, the Moms Program. Um, and so the Moms Partnership is a program that was fairly recently implemented in Vermont. 
and it is an evidence-based program that was developed by Yale University to address the mental health needs of mothers. In particular, mothers who have traditionally been underserved in uh, mental health services. So those are, are mothers experiencing poverty and women of color. Some core elements of the program include a proprietary curriculum that uses cognitive behavioral therapy in a group setting, a, a peer mental health ambassador, which is who is embedded in the group, um, that's a mom who has lived experience, and incentives for, particip for participation, and also radical participant engagement on the front end design. So we surveyed over 140 mothers to find out what was the best design for this program in Vermont to make it work um, for our communities. The program recognizes that mental health is an important piece in interrupting poverty and um, also helps provide longer term stability for the entire family. And it's seen impressive results with participants in the programming ex program experiencing a dramatic decrease in depressive symptoms and um, symptoms of anxiety, an increase in workforce engagement, and an increase in follow through on treatment. And um, similar to the building wealth and health, we don't focus on this program does not focus on the work requirement and it does not explicitly focus on employment however there are employment implications which is really interesting to see so in vermont what this looks like is um the, about a year ago um we started the implement uh, we implemented it um right in the midst of a pandemic prior to that we had spent uh, about a year or more um, in the implementation phase planning for this and that included developing a guide team uh, which was a local a group of local service providers and experts in the field on maternal mental health and nonprofits serving low-income mothers and also doing the goals and needs assessment which was a survey i mentioned of 140 mothers in reach up um, and that survey was developed by yale university and analyzed by data experts at yale to provide us with valuable information about families receiving reach up and what they need from this program our target was to reach 110 mothers in the full year of research so we've almost met that target and um, as i mentioned in march of 2020 uh, despite the COVID-19 pandemic, we were able to launch um, this program in collaboration with a local partner called the Howard Center, who provides mental health services in the Burlington, Vermont community. Um, so originally it was intended to be an in-person group. Um, obviously that wasn't able to happen. And so the Howard Center moms team quickly regrouped and was able to make arrangements to hold the group, group virtually via Zoom, which I'm sure you know, many, many programs across the country have been doing over the last year. And some, there have been some advantages to this actually. So in Vermont, which is very rural, it can sometimes be hard to get a critical mass of people in order to do a project like this in any one given area. And so this has enabled us to spread out a little bit and be able to invite people into the program who may not live right in the Burlington, Vermont area. Um, and then another thing that's been kind of fun is that sometimes children are able to join in um, right there on the session. And so there was an example where there was a snow day um, one day and so all the kiddos were home. And so they all did an exercise together that was um, for the parents and the kids together and all had a, a, a lot of fun with that. So some of the outcomes that we, uh, have already been found that Yale researchers have found, it was the program was actually init initially started in New Haven, Connecticut. So they already have some research from the programs already underway. So it found increased employment, decreased depressive symptoms, moms more likely to be able to meet their basic needs for their families after completing this program. And I should say it's an eight week program. And while it's too early in the study to determine definitive results for Vermont, we do have some preliminary findings that are promising. And the mothers who have participated so far have reported a decrease in depressive symptoms and anxiety. And they've, they've also reported increased social connections. And this is so important, um, obviously, for mental health, for um, employment potential, and especially now when um, Things have been so isolating during the pandemic and 
um, additionally isolating when you're a mother who is living in poverty. Um, so it's been a great opportunity for, for moms to be able to connect with each other. And then I wanted to talk just briefly about some of the other impact that we've heard about. Um, there's been a great deal of interest in the program and the classes have been either full or near full. Some classes have wait lists. Um, and so we know that word is getting out and people are sharing that this has been a great opportunity for them. Um, mothers have said that they have been so grateful for the increased connections within the group, feeling a part of something and the skills that they've learned um, through participating. And our clinician, um, Kirsten, noted uh, what has stood out to me the most about Vermont Moms is the room it makes for moms to make connections with one another and realize they are not alone, especially when it comes to managing the challenges and pressures of parenting and more specifically motherhood. Um, and also it has had a, a, a really strong impact on clinicians and staff. Um, Kirsten also noted, I've even used some of the skills in my own life in order to manage my stress more effectively. And our case managers have, have noted that they've really enjoyed being able to refer folks to this program and then hear about what a, a, an impact it's made on their lives. Excellent. Erin, thank you very much for that uh, description of the Vermont Moms Program. Um, I actually, like listening to all these different panelists, I'm kind of wondering if there are some lessons learned. Like what worked for whom and why? What didn't work for whom and why? And Joe, if you'd be so kind, maybe we can start with Joe, Brandy, Mariana, Nicole, Aaron. You know, I think one of the things that works is really helping people to develop two things. One is a set a sense of autonomy that they are capable of doing things that they may not have confidence that they can do. They may have never had the support. And unfortunately, when you are, you know, when you're receiving benefits and we're talking about work requirements, so much is tied to what you need to do relative to compliance versus autonomy to give people the confidence and the ability to do things uh, on their own. And the second thing I think that, you know, we have really spent a lot of time on is working with people to think about how do you manage your social network, right? How do you create new social networks? Because sometimes the people in your social network, when you are in a boat and you are rowing in a certain destination, if you have people on your boat who are not rowing at all, or who may be rowing in the opposite direction, who constitute your social network, consciously you have to begin to think through, how do I manage these folks? Some people you can't throw completely overboard. Some people maybe you can. But the thing is, how do you raise the consciousness and begin to have these really life decision-making conversations with people to build their autonomy and to think about how the people in their social space, their social networks can inhibit or support their journey to economic self-sufficiency. Very insightful, Joe. Um, Brandy, do you have, uh, there's some kind of lessons learned, best practices with your program that you'd like to share? Yeah, I think um, a couple of key lessons learned that we've had through the years is one of the things that we do that I didn't touch on, but is taking um, participants, we call them participants at our program, on field trips, so to speak, to employers to see what's possible. Oftentimes, not even understanding what all the jobs are in a company. So to, to have a walkthrough to have a company to understand everything that goes into to working, to really start dreaming about what can be, right? So instead of being limited by what we know, to help them really have that hands-on experiential learning is really important to us. So the more that we can provide opportunities for for field trips, for employers to come to speak to them, for our mentors to engage with them in different ways is a critical way to keep them engaged and really to move forward. And the other piece, and I, I shared at the beginning, but I think it does make a world of difference, is that commitment to lifelong engagement. Regardless of how it's funded, you know, you get a grant, it says, okay, serve them for X amount of, you know, months, but it doesn't take, it takes a long time to move past um, those, those roadblocks, right? And, to, to really get to that, that economic independence. So that's a big piece for us. We see every single day 
participants who've been with us, who've been working, who maybe are ready to move on to that next job. Maybe they got laid off and they're coming back in to see us. Perhaps they've moved away and they come back. And I think that connection and that continuity to community and to, to connections is really important that they know um, that they can come back at any given time and we're here for that long haul. So we invest that from day one and continue throughout. And then again, that experiential learning is super critical for us. Um, it's not classroom style, the more that we can get them exposed to other opportunities is key. Excellent, thank you. Um, Marianna, how about your observations, lessons learned? Sure. Um, first of all, I just wanna say all these programs sound totally wonderful and I'm so glad to be a part of it. Um, what the members of the network really love about the program uh, is what they talk about as sort of this feeling of humanity. Uh, you all treat us like human beings. You're human, uh, which I think is, <laughs> it's a, it sounds very simplistic, but it's actually a major cultural shift that needs to happen in TANF programming and in TANF programming, you know, throughout the country is that, uh, People have felt uh, surveilled, felt as if they're treated as if they are less than, and there's something very freeing and uh, beautiful about when they come to our program, they're so happy, like, oh, this is great. There's coffee. I can relate to you as a human being, which um, it sounds so element elemental, and we do all this other programming, which we know is what actually helps it to work, but that should make us pause, shouldn't it? that uh, we you know, have not been acknowledging the humanity and the beauty and the resilience of the members in our program, which calls for major structural and cultural change in TANF itself. We have to say that we have, our team has had to work really hard to keep the state and their surveillance machine off of the backs of our members. So the biggest challenge for us has been actually uh, collaborating with the state and actually complying with all of the programmatic requirements while not re-traumatizing our um, the members in the network. So we really need to look inward among TANF participants. And the last thing I have to say is um, the TANF grant amount is, is criminally low in the state of Pennsylvania. And I'd say around the country, we keep people at the 25% 25% of the federal poverty line. One thing that we can do to encourage long-term uh, success among uh, TANF participants has actually increased the grant amount. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Nicole, any kind of like lessons learned or epiphanies? Yeah, I mean, I think there's very similar things across programs that are lessons learned because I've heard a lot of what other people have shared and really felt those are similar aspects for us. I think uh, really getting some buy-in from at least one or two key employers was really beneficial for us because then they would network within associations with other employers to really get them to buy into hiring this population. I think there's kind of a negative connotation to hiring individuals that have been on public assistance. And when an employer knows that they tend to kind of be a little standoffish and not really see the value of these individuals and what they can bring to their organization. Um, we had one employer that really latched on and had a lot of success and was able to quickly promote a couple of our participants and saw the value of these individuals and what they could bring to their organization. And that helped to shape um, conversations and partnerships we had with other employers. So really, um, I think bringing Bringing other partners and individuals on board is super helpful to that and I will also echo just celebrating with people like one of the best parts I think of our program is we have a graduation um, for their certificate that is I would say just as good as any diploma graduation and it is the best part hands down to see participants and their families celebrate that success and see the value of those individuals and it's been really empowering to see individuals see their own value through that opportunity so i think that's super empowering that's extraordinary thank you nicole and aaron you kind of get the last word on the panel <laughs> Um, so I think one of the biggest successes of the MOMS partnership has been the community, the role of the community mental health ambassador. 
And ours, the, um, our community mental health ambassador is just this incredible woman who is able to approach any kind of problem with curiosity and compassion and how can, from this perspective of how can I help. And I think that that um, that combined with just the cohesiveness of the groups and the social connections that they're making with each other is helping moms to feel not so alone. And it is really, mental health issues have been really stigmatized in, um, in this country and being, um, receiving TANF has been incredibly stigmatizing and very traumatic for a lot of people over the history of TANF and work requirements and um, how it has unrolled. So, um, so it, you know, having that um, camaraderie and that ability to kind of understand, like, I'm not alone, you know, this whole group of women is experiencing the similar situation and we can rely on each other and be able to um, connect even beyond the group and have have some of those social connections I think has been uh, really valuable and important. Erin, thank you. And uh, on behalf of our OFA colleagues, uh, I want to thank all of today's panelists. It was a pretty extraordinary session and uh, really I think we all learned a lot. It's tremendous. And at this point, we're going to turn over, we have a 10 minute break, and I believe there is a poll that will be administered. And uh, I just wanted to thank you all. And um, I've thoroughly enjoyed it, learned a tremendous amount, and uh, look forward to this continued discussion. Back to you, Steve. Excellent. Here we are. Hi, everyone. I'm Shelley Osborne with ICF, and I will be moderating our next group of panelists. So as you can see on the screen, we're going to start off with Mary Beth Vogel Ferguson, um, College of Social Work at the University of Utah. We're going to go to Megan Kaufman, who's with the Employment and Benefits Division. She's an evaluator with Colorado Department of Human Services. Next will be Katie Hogarty, Director of External Relations with Climb Wyoming. And then we're going to have Bonisa West, Program Director for Arkansas Career Pathways Institute. Um, we don't have Jamie Woodson with us today, so we just have the four speakers and myself moderating. I'll stay on video while I'm moderating or introducing and asking questions um, and off video the rest of the time. So we're going to go ahead and get started with Mary Beth as our first speaker. Good morning, my name is Mary Beth Vogel Ferguson and uh, for the past 22 years I've served as a third party evaluator for Utah's Department of Workforce Services, uh, who you heard from a little bit earlier. Our main focus has been on helping the agency better understand the basic profile, attitudes, supports and barriers for TANF recipients and how these have changed over time. Today I'll share with you some of what we've learned from participants in Utah's Family Employment Program, um, the name of our TANF Cash Assistance Program. Next. And our study focuses on new cash assistance recipients who are required to participate in countable activities and follow their outcomes over time. Participation in the in-person interview is of course voluntary and a portion of the interview is recorded to obtain direct quotes from our customer's experience. Next. Each study participant is interviewed, as I said, within a few months of opening cash assistance. Then regardless of whether or not their cash stays open, or even if they leave the state, we seek to interview the same people both 12 and 24 months after their initial interview. And you can see from the sample size there, we have a very good um, sample size for our study. Next. Um, we asked people about what happened and changed in their cash assistance. Most people are not just walking down the street one day and decide to apply for cash assistance. When asked what changed in your financial situation that you needed help, the largest group actually lost their own job. They had been working and for any number of reasons they were not able to continue. About a quarter lost their support from a spouse or partner and then about another quarter had been relying on family or friends for support. Next. We also asked people to describe how it felt kind of walking in the door to apply for the cash assistance that first time. As you can see, for most people, this is a really difficult step. In fact, if someone was going to become an emotional during the interview, it was this question that kind of triggered them having to respond to that. A large portion of the sample had never accessed any type of benefits and this represented really for them a personal failure. Next. As one person said, 
this was, um, I was humiliated because I had never had to do this before in my life. Before my accident, I was always independent and took care of myself and my family. This was actually a male respondent and asking for assistance has kind of a double layer um, when you talk about receiving cash assistance. You don't hear a lot about welfare dads. Next. A couple of other thoughts. In despair, I grew up to thinking people on welfare were less. My family looked down on people on welfare. Ashamed, I felt judged by my family. I just couldn't believe it. I came from a good family, but through my mistakes, I ended up needing it. I felt like there was something wrong with me, like a welfare mom. So even though this person actually was official welfare mom, uh, she didn't identify with kind of the negative stereotypical views that often come with this group. Next. So when you think about how TANF recipients are typically viewed by policymakers as young, single, never married, with limited work history and education histories, we see that that just match about 11% of our population. There's a lot of common assumptions about the characteristics and attitudes of TANF recipients, and that often missed the mark and certainly then impacted the effectiveness of programs that are designed to serve a majority of the population that isn't present. Next. We see this when we look at the usage patterns of our cohort over time. Only about a third used more than six months of benefits in the 12 months after their first interview. And 74% had no months of cash assistance between 12 and 24 months after the first interview. Next. In this study, we also included questions from the Adverse Childhood Experiences or ACEs study. As you can see, the TANF population in the yellow bars has a significantly higher rate of ACEs than the general population of Utah, the pink bars, with nearly 46% with five or more ACEs, while the same is true of only about 10% of the general population. So looking at how our TANF recipients are different than other Utahns. Next. And overall, from this research, we know that high ACE scores are strong predictors of what happens later in life in terms of health outcomes, social problems, disease incidents, and early death. So we asked the question, are ACEs as str also strong predictors of what happens later in life in terms of cash assistance utilization? Next. Just like in the ACEs study, within our TANF group, high ACE scores are correlated to a wide variety of employment barriers and challenges in the activities of daily living. Interestingly, TANF recipients with high ACE scores are engaged in work and work activities at the same rate as other TANF recipients. However, they're not achieving the same level of benefit from employment. They generally have lower wages, less consistent employment, fewer benefits, or jobs with lower growth potential. Lower levels of benefit employment increases the likelihood of a family then remaining in poverty longer. Next. The high levels of stress and adversity in childhood can also impact brain development and executive functioning skills. And when you see the skills listed here, these skills are often associated with a success in adult, adult activities, particularly employment, as they're related to what employers ask for most, which is the soft skills. IT, um, it is a problem solving, critical thinking, time management, and self-regulation that are needed most to keep a job. I remember in a small town where I did an interview once interviewing a woman who said, I have no problem getting a job. I just can't keep it because I have no idea how to get myself and my son out the door and where we need to be on time. Next. While we recognize the higher ACE scores in FEP sample is important, we also know that ACE score is not a diagnosis or a label that we can put on a person. As one wise case manager noted, just because I know an ACE history doesn't mean I really know anything about a person's ability to work. We also want to explore their sources of resilience, their supports, their personal strengths. Next. And so what we found is we looked at the distribution of recipients um, across the board. About a quarter actually did have sustained issues that were going to make them hard to employ no matter what long term. But about 25% came in with very transitional issues and they just needed a little bit of support to be launched back into employment. What's most important is that group in the middle, the 50% that come in really ready and interested in working, but need some supports, need some other pieces to be put in place before that can happen. Next. 
we asked um, by far the most common response related to the question, thinking big picture from the time you walked into DWS until now, what part of working with DWS has been the most helpful to you? A person, program, a way of thinking? As one person said, um, she, my caseworker, was really supportive and gave me different options of stuff I could do. I felt like it was a really open environment where I could talk to her and I could go to her. Um, she always gave me options and it didn't seem like I had nothing to do or nowhere to go. I guess the way they treated me. They didn't treat me like a number or just another welfare case. They treated me like a person. Uh, participants often could compare experiences over time. As one person said, I kind of got bumped around from caseworker to caseworker. By the time I got to my fourth one, she was the most understanding of all. She was the one who got the financial assistance for school. She was the one who made me go, thank you, because I'm trying so hard to do what I'm supposed to do. My worker saw my end goal and helped me get there. Next. Another question that we asked, what else do you think DWS could have done as you started assistance that would have been more helpful? About a quarter saw nothing more that could be improved, which is really helpful. Those who did most referenced improved case management, individualized processes, and support for focusing on client-centered goals. Next. And finally, we asked, how do you feel that you've become more self-sufficient since working with DWS? Here are some thoughts. One person said, I think I have more courage when it comes to finding work. I have more confidence than before in my interview. My resume is more appropriate now. There's a lot of very specific tools that help me understand um, how to work in an environment where it's competitive. Another one, I was going through a very huge transitional period. I was without a job for the first time in my life. Now I've got a stable job. I have stable pay that comes in every week. And I mean, I love my job. I get along well with all my caseworkers, my supervisors, my manager. I love it. I love just feeling stable. So we see, I'm sorry, next. We see that as we put all these pieces together and move forward, DWS wants to continue to use what we've learned to fill in missing pieces by addressing the challenges to work and supporting parents. We're working toward improving parental functioning and well being, and thus making a better life for the next generation. Thanks so much. All right, now we're going to go to Megan Kaufman with the Employment and Benefits Division. She's an evaluator with the Colorado Department of Human Services. All right. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Megan Kaufman. I'm the Division Evaluator with the Employment and Benefits Division, which is in the state of Colorado's Department of Human Services. Um, I'll discuss some of the data we've collected through our most recent LEVER study, which ran from 2016 to 2020. If you go to the next slide, please. So before I do that, a little bit more about TANF in Colorado. So TANF in Colorado is also known as Colorado Works. In Colorado, we are a state supervised county administered program, meaning that the state provides guidance and decision making around how the program runs through policies, training and monitoring, but the counties themselves administer the program. And there are 64 counties in Colorado, as you can see on this map here. All right, next slide, please. So a little bit about the TANF Lever survey. So this presentation is going to focus on what we've learned from our most recent TANF Lever study, which concluded in June of 2020. And the study's primary aims were to gain a deeper understanding of the reasons why TANF clients leave the program, as well as client experiences, perceptions, and satisfaction with the program and its services. So the survey was administered to TANF clients who had recently left the program. Um, the survey was mostly closed responses, but had some open-ended responses, and it took participants about 14 minutes to complete on average. Uh, data collection occurred through nine waves over multiple years, and approximately 8,500 clients who exited the Colorado Works program were surveyed. Next slide, please. So I'll speak to some of our qualitative data here soon, but I wanted to point out that we also have some sense through our quantitative data collected from the survey around how common employment success is once people leave the program. So about 48% of our one and two parent family respondents said that they left Colorado Works because they got a job or their wages increased. So about half of these families had a positive employment outcome by the time they left. 28% uh, of our one and two parent family respondents said that their income was higher after leaving Colorado Works than it was when they joined. So this is an area that we can work on, but it also demonstrates that a sizable portion of these families are reaching higher income 
And then the final data point I wanted to share here is that 89% um, of our respondents across all family types, so one, two parent family and also child only, agreed or strongly agreed that the services they received while with Colorado Works helped their children. So the last data point really speaks more to our program success in terms of how we as a state are helping to meet children's needs through TANF. So those are some of our data points for the Lever survey that tell us about success. So let's move on to the next slide, please. So I wanna speak a little about the qualitative data that we have. So in our Lever survey, we didn't have additional focus groups or one-on-one -on -one interviews where we gathered our stories from TANF participants. So we don't have sort, sort of that long form storytelling narrative data. However, we did have two open-ended questions specifically on the survey that can help us understand how clients achieved employment success and how the program helped their children. So these are the two questions we analyzed um, to help better understand success. So it's how did you get this job? And then in what ways did Colorado Works help meet your children's needs? Next slide, please. So this slide shows the most common responses from clients to that open-ended question of how did you get your job? So um, I'm sharing these responses because a key marker of success in TANF is employment. So how clients find employment is part of the success story. Um, overwhelmingly, the most common response was networking through friends, family, or just in day-to-day -day life was how they got their job. So this could be daycare, preschool drop-offs, um, talking with the landlord, speaking with a family member, and then becoming employed in the same place. So um, I can read a couple of quotes to illustrate this. So one said that a friend told them I was a good worker, so they hired me, or a relative put a good word in for me at her job and they gave me a shot. Um, the other most common response as to how participants got their job was online job posting sources. Um, and interestingly, Indeed was by far the most common site that clients said they used to find their jobs. Um, but they also used other online networking and job sites like Facebook, Snag a Job, Craigslist, and ZipRecruiter. Um, to illustrate this, one participant um, said, I was offered an interview through Indeed from the company. All right, next slide, please. Um, so the other question we looked at was, um, how did TANF help meet children's needs? So this data tells us more about how we as an agency can successfully meet children's needs through our services. The most common response from clients was that TANF supports their children through financial assistance that helps meet the day-to-day -day expenses and provide that economic stability. So the financial assistance can help with food, clothing, housing, rent, school supplies for children, hygienic supplies for children, making sure the bills get paid. Uh, to illustrate this, one participant said, it helped me make sure my son has all he needs and all our bills got paid. And the financial assistance helped me to buy my kids hygiene items and clothes to wear to school. So the second most common response from clients was that TANF caseworkers refer them to other, other benefit programs that help their children. So clients say that other programs like CCAP, which is our child care assistance, food stamps, Medicaid, and energy assistance can help meet children's needs. So the referrals that our TANF caseworkers are making are really important. To illustrate this, one participant said, CCAP paid for my daughters to go to daycare so I could go back to school. And they referred me to WIC and CCAP, which aided in my child's development and hunger. Uh, next slide, please. So lastly, just some, some takeaways from this presentation. We found that networking and Indeed are common ways that clients reported getting jobs. Um, families do value caseworkers connecting them to other benefit programs to support their children. And then the financial supports that we provide through Colorado Works help meet children's needs. And in future studies, we're interested in looking at how can we promote further success by increasing engagement with the program. So that's all for me. Thanks for listening, and I look forward to the discussion. All right. Thank you, Megan. That's, you know, 8,500 surveys. I'm sure you have a lot of information <laughs> that you could have presented. So thank you for that. So next up, we have Katie. Hi, thank you, Shelley, and uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Katie Hogarty. I'm the Director of External Relations for CLIMB Wyoming. And uh, before I dive in, just wanted to acknowledge um, all the hard work that everyone is doing. You um, all are working with populations in, that are in such high need right now, as well as managing your own lives in a really complicated time. And so just want, I'm really appreciating everyone that's taking the time to participate in this today. And um, if you're anything like me, Zoom fatigue is real. I would much prefer to be having this conversation in a room with you where I could see your faces and uh, just engage with you. This is 
uh, not my comfort zone to do a PowerPoint over Zoom, but I'm super excited to be able to share uh, a little bit about CLIMB and our data strategy with you. CLIMB is a Wyoming nonprofit uh, that provides mental health-based comprehensive job training and job placement to low-income single moms. I'll talk a little bit about how the participants intersect with our data throughout this time and would love to do that through a particular uh, graduate that I had the pleasure of working with um, almost 10 years ago. Um, so I'd like to tell the data story through a graduate uh, named Marissa. So this, uh, I'd like to introduce you uh, to Marissa through a video that she made several years ago. Could you start the video? Thank you, Steve. participants and as, as well as I know Marissa, I still get choked up thinking about how far she's come and what her life looked like before she came into the CLIMB program. And uh, before I uh, was putting, while I was putting this presentation together, it felt very important to connect with Marissa to see where she is now and to get her permission to share her story on such a large stage. And when, when I was connecting with her, she was very clear that she wanted me to share with you all that since this video has been made, her income has increased from $28,000 a year to over $43,000 a year. And she's a supervisor now. And uh, she was just got, uh, she's giggling when she was sharing this with me. She said she works at, uh, at the University of Wyoming in the Department of Molecular Biology. She said, Katie, can you remember when I interviewed for that job and I couldn't pronounce molecular? And she said, I'm supervising. I'm the supervisor in that department now. And she was so proud. She also wanted me to share with you uh, that since that time, she bought her her own home. And it's uh, for those of you not familiar with Laramie, Wyoming, she wanted you to know it's in the nice part of town. She was so proud of how far she's come and where she is now. And as I am showing this slide, uh, this, the um, yellow greenish dot line across the bottom shows where most of our the income level, where mo most of our participants start the program, which is zero. Uh, CLIMB serves participants at the 30% um, of the federal poverty level. Um, Marissa could not connect with the time before the program where she was having to make decisions about 
do I put gas in my car or do I uh, put food on my table? Um, I just got the notice that there's two minutes to wrap up. So Steve, could you move on to the next slide, please? Uh, this slide shows an overview of how and where our participants intersect with data. We're collecting data at, e at each phase of the program. Um, and we work with cohorts of women at a time, uh, serving between 10 and well, uh, 12 women in each program. Next slide, please. Um, how we collect data is as important as the data that we collect. As you heard me talk about, uh, confidentiality is very important. Uh, we want to work with our partners, uh, with our graduates and participants in partnership. These are their stories and their lives and making sure that we hold um, the values around how we collect the data feels incredibly critical. And uh, we try so hard to be conservative with our data and not reinforce the negative stereotype of low income single mom. So oftentimes that's to a disadvantage of our data. The story could look a little bit different, but we want to be very respectful of those. Um, the values around our participants. Next slide, please. I showed the, uh, the phases of the program. During the comprehensive training phase of the program, um, we do mental health and executive functioning pre and post uh, assessments with our participants. We do that to help the mental health counselor really identify barriers to work, uh, which I think increase our long-term outcomes. When you really identify what's getting in the way of getting to work on time or what's getting in the way of emotional regulation, it really supports long-term outcome statistics. So we use this data to um, that support our long-term outcomes, but really support the um, therapeutic approach that we work with each participant. Next slide, please. Um, our outcomes are incredibly strong. And um, during the last phase of the program, the graduate support we use uh, we're connecting with our participants every three months for the first year and that's a client employee reaching out to a mom to hear how she's doing we um, collect this data through the relationship through any advocacy or support that we could offer the participant and um, we learn a lot and can support participants in their long-term work uh, through this follow-up process for example, uh, when I called Marissa during it was her nine month follow up in her job at the University of Wyoming and learned that um, her sister had tragically passed away in an accident and it was obviously very traumatic and troubling for Marissa. And through that conversation, through the data collection, I was able to understand what was really happening for her as a person and work and was connected her with our mental health provider. So she was able to get support that she needed to be able to keep her job through a really traumatic time in her life. So not only are we collecting the data, but the, we're working with our participants during that time to support uh, the outcomes and to support the participants. And you can see um, through this slide that that really works. Next slide, please. This is a different graduate. This is Lindsay, but just an interesting way that we can help visualize our data. We're in, we have such strong relationships with our participants. Our private uh, donors really like to see, and public donors like to see the return on investment and what the ROI is. So this is a graphic that we used in our, our, our latest progress report to really demonstrate the strong return on investment that crime has. And we learned this data through the relationship and uh, uh, through the mom's success. Um, I know it's time to wrap up. I'm looking forward to connecting with you during the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Katie. It's an inspirational story and some impressive outcomes and also great graphic visualization as well. So <laughs> thank you for that. All right. So our last speaker is Monisa West um, with uh, Arkansas Division of Higher Education, uh, Career Pathways. So thank you, Shelley. Thank you. If we could go to the next slide, please, Dave. So let me just give you a quick brief overview. Um, when TANF money comes to the state of Arkansas, it goes to the Department of Human Services. They outsource the case management of that, um, of uh, getting people off of assistance and into work to the Department of Workforce Services. And then they, third step, uh, outsource the uh, education and training component of that to the Arkansas Division of Higher Education through the Arkansas Career Pathways Initiative. So we, um, are just like most of you, our mission is to end that dependence on government services. We do that in our, in our specific program through increased enrollment in post-secondary programs retaining them, completing them, and getting them into a job that is uh, better off than where they were when they started our program. 
we um, had we participated in the College Counts Research uh, Initiative a few years ago before my time, but uh, digging that uh, data out, uh, it was very clear that the that we provide through CPI are actually very effective with graduation rates multiple times higher than the norm, um, um, particularly among peer groups. Uh, our outcomes were much stronger. And uh, so it's, it's a very well-intentioned program with really solid results. And I wanna share some of those stories with you if I could go on to the next slide. We started in 2005 and we have 25 sites at two-year colleges around the state of Arkansas. And we enroll students in four credit as well as short-term training programs. And uh, we serve about oh, around 3,000 students on an annual basis. So you can see what our, uh, we are predominantly white. Um, uh, this kind of fits the demographics of the state of Arkansas. Uh, really predominantly female. Uh, most of our graduates, over half of them are in allied health, a lot of those in nursing, which is a high demand. And we have an average age of around 36, and that is declining as we go along. So we, around 15 years, served around 90,000 people. And so if we could go on to the next slide. So student eligibility, uh, they have to have a child in the home that's under the age of 21. Uh, they have to either be on one of the, the uh, support uh, programs like SNAP or uh, Medicaid or, or um, uh, our kids, those kinds of things. If they are not on that, then they have to meet a threshold of 250% of the federal poverty level. So, um, so it is income related and having that child in the home. Next slide. We are very restrictive on what we provide. It is about anything related to education and uh, that is not met by another program. Uh, CPI is a provider of last resort. So if they have Pell, for example, uh, until that's exhausted, we do not kick in any services. But we do meet the two basic major obstructions to education, and that is childcare and transportation. We will provide them with direct uh, educational expenses that are associated with education, but also technology needs, uh, laptops, internet access, hotspots, you name it. But probably the real success comes from the case management and the support services, the wraparound services, that um, that you uh, would think that we would do. So we have a couple of pilots that I think are going to, uh, uh, that show great promise. One is called Education Pays, which is to help us increase our enrollment and our outreach. And we will pay $100 to a brand new temporary employment assistance T person when they log up, when they sign into our program. If they're still going strong at midterm, we'll give them $300. And if they have completed the semester with a 2.0, taking at least six hours, then we'll give them another $300. And that will continue until they complete their degree plan, at which time they will get $500. So it is a way to encourage persistence, but it is also a way to get discretionary money into the pockets uh, that where of the people where they can spend it on their family and meet some of the other needs that have been uh, mentioned here today. So next slide. I want to, um, uh, that, that's just a kind of a really brief overview. I want to show you a movie uh, of uh, Charletta. And uh, uh, Steve, if you would go ahead and hit that, please. Hi, my name is Charletta. I'm a 26 year old nurse, I'm an RN. And I have a six-year-old son. I work at a nursing home. I've been a nurse for about eight months now, and I've already became a, a weekend supervisor. And I'm also a first-time home buyer. I'm just on a journey to better myself. It's becoming a better nurse and just flourishing in life. What it means to me to be able to buy a home at the age of 26 is a lot. It means I'm, I'm, I'm proud of that because my mom, she never really owned anything or my dad. So it's just been a blessing to be able to buy a home and to be able to provide for my son in a way that he can grow up in a nice neighborhood and that he won't have to live in the projects anymore. The reason why I think I became a nurse is because growing up, I knew that I always wanted to help people and 
nursing is a pathway that I chose so I can help people. As being a single parent of a young child, it was conflicting with our education. Me getting my education as well as him getting his education. And there was a lot of trials in that area. But we figured it out by using time management skills and just taking it day by day. Career Pathways has contributed to my life in many ways and some of the ways that they have contributed is helping me with tuition, books, and childcare for my child. It meant a lot to me because I didn't I graduated school without any debt. So I was very grateful for that and it helped me along my journey. Without career pathways, I wouldn't have have been able to obtain a nursing career without having debt. I wouldn't have been able to own my own home. I just would like to say Thank you all very much for your help and your support throughout my journey of nursing school and everything that you've done for me from uniforms to everything, gas cars, everything. It was a very great help for me and my son and I'm just so very grateful for it. So that is Charletta, and she is very representative of many of the stories that I could tell today, but I do want to introduce you to just a couple of other people before, before I wrap up. Uh, if we can get to the next slide. Let, let me move on. Uh, okay, here we go. Uh, Candace is a uh, young lady that when she was 19, she had her own child responsible for four siblings, mother in jail, and she is now a doctor, uh, a nurse practitioner at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. Um, and I'm, I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. She um, went from struggling head of household to strong independent woman. Let's do next slide. Uh, Willie, Willie Thomas, uh, where you see the um, um, ambulance, he was picking up trash, driving a trash truck until he got involved with CPI, and now he's a paramedic working for major hospitals in the Memphis area. So let's go to the next slide. I wanna close on Mikey down at the bottom of the, of the screen. You see his tricked out truck. He um, was, um, um, had a two-year-old daughter and uh, really did in jobs working here or there. Thought he liked to travel, thought he might like to be a, a truck driver. So he enrolled in a, with CPI at one of the community colleges. And he now has this tricked out truck because Mikey is now hauling bulls nationwide for a farming operation. And Mikey in his little truck and those bulls are affording him anywhere from $2,000 to $2,500 a week. I think I'm in the wrong business. I need, I need a truck and some bulls to haul around because those are some pretty, pretty amazing results. Not everybody's that way, but many strong success stories. I'll be glad to discuss more of those and some of the other particulars as we get into the discussion group. But thank you for your time today and allow me to share our great stories. Thank you so much. More inspirational stories. So um, I'm going to start off with a question for Megan, um, but I would like sort of the rest of the presenters to chime in as well. So as Megan is speaking, you can be prepping your answers. So um, Megan, I wanted to know, I mean, in, in the, the length of time that you've been doing, you know, your survey, which is obviously a long time, you know, kind of what is surprised you about, I mean, it could be anything about the data collection process, the findings maybe from a particular, for the rest of you, maybe a particular former participant. So like, what, is, what has surprised you during this process? Yeah, I think what surprised me the most was that it was really common for participants who completed the survey to do so on their smartphone. Um, we learned that nearly 84% completed it on their smartphone, so that was surprising to me. I didn't know that that was um, uh, accessible to, to that many people, so that's what surprised me. Excellent. They're either Katie or Mary Beth or Onisa. I think I'm, I'm surprised at just the resiliency of the people that we work with. 
uh, those that have that strong desire that are ready to make a change, they move heaven and earth to make it happen. And with, with, but they need resources and, and that's where we came in. So I've just always admired the, the initiative and the, the stick to it grit that um, folks with low, low resources have. And I would, I would actually echo that, that the, the level of resilience. I grew up with very stereotypical views of people receiving public benefits and kind of a, a bootstrap mentality. And after hearing the stories, um, I, I've been inspired by the resilience and by the, um, what people will, will do to be able to be successful and to be able to take care of their children. Um, it is very inspiring to me personally. I think that's the key. It, you know, get to them about their kids and they will literally move heaven and earth. I completely agree with that. And <clears throat> what surprised me, I've been with Klein for over 10 years and what continues to surprise me is that the moms that we work with refuse to settle for the job that they get through Klein. And so watching moms that are in the CNA jobs go on to become RNs or go back to school or watching moms that are in truck driving jobs uh, continue to grow and uh, manage and become supervisors. Uh, I'm just saying what everyone else is, the resiliency and uh, tenacity is, doesn't surprise me anymore, but it's uh, beautiful to experience alongside a participant. And if you're looking to change generational poverty, that's how you do it. And so probably four of the six people that I interviewed for this presentation um, they ended with impact on their children. My kids are now going to school, to college because they saw me go. Just that whole whole change, most generational change, is probably the long term impact of, of what we're doing. Great. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I find that to be really important, um, giving people ideas that there's even options, because when you saw the level of adverse childhood experiences in our study, um, a lot of the, our participants grew up in environments that they didn't even know that there was anything different. So it's not about not choosing to make good choice. It's about not even knowing there's a choice. And once they're provided with the information and the, and the perspective to say there can be something different, uh, they latch right onto it. And, and I think it's just uh, being willing to take that step. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> Katie, you mentioned your 10 years with your organization um, and your, your program has an impressive amount of, you know, kind of connection post program being able to track someone down after, you know, kind of a, a while that they've been out of the program sort of how do, how do you do that? <laughs> um, you know, what are your strategies? Well, I think first and foremost, Climb is a relationship-driven organization. So we do that with all of our program staff through the relationship that we have with each, uh, each mom. And we plant the seed so early on that data is an important part of our program. So we're talking about that during the application process and during intake. We're, we're asking the participants for their permission to collect the data and showing them how we use it, which is so inspiring for them to think at that point at, at intake where they could be in the future. And we, as we continue to move through the program, we're, we talk about data and how we use it. We remind them that for the first year after they graduate, a CLIMB staff member will call them every three months. And in that second year, we have um, an independent contractor through the university call them to collect data. So we're having somebody else other than CLIMB aggregate our data after the second year. So we're reminding them of that process. We have a graduate come and talk to the participants about what it's like to have uh, someone from WISAC, this, uh, this other entity, call them and reach out to them. And we're in um, partnership with the moms to ask them, how do you want us to reach out to you? Is it by text? Is it uh, a phone call? Do you want us to Facebook message you? How do you want us to be in contact with you? And how do you want WISAC to be in contact with you so that you so that she has agency in, the, in how we're collecting the data and what that looks like. So I think that um, translates to a pretty high success rate. We have about 80% um, participant respond to the first year of collecting data when CLIMB is reaching out. And the second year, it's upwards of 70% when the, the third party uh, person is calling. So we have really, we do have high um, contact rates with our graduates. I think it's because we plant the seed and do it through the relationship. And Mary Beth, particularly, um, you know, same same thing. You had some pretty impressive response rates for contact. So, how, you know, what's your what's your secret sauce for that? 
I would I would echo one thing Katie said is that just the idea of asking participants what's the best way to get in touch with you. And so really putting them in the driver's seat for the whole process. They get to choose in our study where they want to have the interview done, set a time that's convenient for them, recognizing that we don't have data without participants. So they really are um, the, the main force that drives the process and showing them that respect. Actually, a lot of people talk about not feeling like when they engage with agencies that they're treated with respect or given any power in the relationship. And so we try to really make sure that happens. As well, we have a very strong relationship with our Department of Workforce Services. So uh, we have access to information. So when somebody does move or change, we have contact information from them as well as uh, our relationship with the agency to help continue getting that contact information. Great. All right, so um, Monisa, going all the way sort of back to the beginning with your program, how do you find, um, you know, the students for your program? So, well, we have a director and a staff on each one of those 25 campuses, and they have, going back to the, the relationship, they build relationships internally within the campus, financial aid, student support, those kinds of things. And so those folks know, oh, this person is a T recipient, or this person is that, and they refer them over. Now, we, we have not as much external outreach recently as we should. We're getting back on that bandwagon, but we also have moved to social media, which has been very, very effective with a lot of people. Word of mouth is, is strong. Um, we also try to go where they are, where our potential students are, that is at a local nonprofit, a church, or what have you. But um, we're also trying to, we've also just started something that's kind of fun, I think, those of you that have small children or small grandchildren, you know, today's moms, they like to have those milestone pictures. So when my grandson was three weeks, I have a picture of him laying on a rug with a little chalkboard that says three months. And then I have one that says four months. And my Lord, she's just worn me out with all pictures. But moms like to do that. So we developed these series of milestone cards that are in the um, public health units, the county health units throughout the state. And they are a series of cards from birth through one year old and then kindergarten through um, uh, graduation. And uh, so, and they, they're, they're really pretty and attractive. And, and so moms can pick these up and take them home and do their milestone photos with that. The real kicker though is if you turn the card over, there's a message for mom that says, oh, your child's three months old. She or he should be doing so and so and so and so. And then, and, oh, by the way, have you thought about your own education? So the last, the third part of that triplet uh, series is for the mom. I enrolled in college today, my milestone. I got my first A milestone. I got my job milestone. So we'll see how those goes, but it's just an effort to reach out to where they are with a message that hooks them in. And then we come in for the kill to get them to enroll in college. So other, other ways, but those are a couple of uh, cool ideas, I think. Yeah, that's inventive. <laughs> Um, so, uh, switching gears a little bit, um, you, know, you guys obviously have learned a lot doing this, you know, the way that you've been doing it, tracking participants for a long time, doing a mix of quantitative and qualitative data to get the hard numbers that a lot of people want, funders particularly, um, you know, but also those qualitative stories, the narratives, the videos. Um, what what don't you know? Like, what, what outstanding research questions do you have? Um, you know, kind of where do you see the next step in terms of what else, what other research you want to do? Is there anything on your, on your research bucket list, if you will? Was that to everyone? To everyone, anyone. <laughs> Well, I would like to. I would like to know more about what it uh, requires to attract more men to the program, and I would like to know what it takes to attract more women to skilled trades, because that's where the money is. That's how you improve life. Um, so I, I would like to know more about that, and we're going to be pursuing that here in Arkansas. Great. I guess. Where's, go ahead, Mabeth. I guess just one thing I would like to know, and and. Actually, this is not from participants, but I would love to be able to say, how do we translate all this great data that we have and these experiences with these participants to policymakers in a way that would help them understand that programs need to be designed for the people and the needs of the people that are receiving the programs and not to the stereotype. I would love to be able to um, 
have that conversation so that we could really, on a broad scale, not just these individual programs, um, help folks uh, in the way that they really want and need. Mary Beth, I love that so much because I've forgotten which speaker it was that said only 11% fit the stereotype. I would love to learn more from our, we have so many qualitative stories from our employer partners. I'd love to have some more quantitative data from our employers. We work with um, such solid partners who are a key to the mom's long-term success at work. I just love to learn um, more about them and connect some of our executive functioning data with job success. So is there, what is the um, connection between a mom's improvement in executive functioning skills and her job outcome and wage? And I think something we're interested in is we're um, being really intentional and enhancing the way we do case management and integrating intentional coaching models into case management. So I just really love to know over time, is that making a difference for some of the outcomes we're interested in, employment outcomes and other kinds of outcomes? Great. So um... I'm sure you've probably been asked this in other panels that you participated in in the you know past year or so, but you know how has COVID impacted your ability or your strategies to track participants? And you know, is there any has there been any sort of unexpected success? So something that you sort of had to do because of COVID, like these virtual you know conferences and presentations, anything that you sort of had to do that you think will that you'll continue doing because it's been successful, because it's helped you, you know, stay connected to former participants. And that's to anyone who wants to answer. <laughs> the, at the beginning of COVID, we started to hear a lot from graduates um, that were working. And my fear was that they were reaching out to climb because they had lost their job or had been laid off. And the beautiful surprise is that graduates were saying, I have a job. How can I help moms that don't have jobs right now? Can I donate food? Where can I, where can I give support? That was such a beautiful and touching part of the beginning of the pandemic for me. What was what I was learning from our really resilient graduates who were working and wanting to uh, give it back to uh, show their support to their communities. And we've learned how we can uh, bolster the first part of our program, which is pre-program stabilization. We've been able to offer that um, to far more candidates now than we were before COVID because of how we're delivering services virtually. And obviously Wyoming is a very rural state. And so uh, participants uh, sometimes have to drive hundreds of miles to get to a site where they can participate in a program. So being able to offer those resources virtually now has really impacted our ability to serve more people. And we've increased our reach to uh, five additional counties in the state, which is huge for us. Right. All right. So um, we just have a few minutes left. I think about one minute. So any any parting comments? Any anything that anybody else wants to add? I won't ask a specific question because I'll probably have to cut you off. But any any parting comments or thoughts you guys want to share? I would just say relative to the COVID that um, the front frontline workers have been incredibly stressed by this process, not being able to meet with clients, not being able to provide services about people that they really care about. And so taking care of our frontline staff and um, helping them with their secondary trauma is really a key to uh, keeping that relationship between the worker and the client strong by supporting those workers. So shout out to all the workers who are doing really great things to try to stay connected to their clients. Yeah, excellent point. All right, I wanna thank you guys all for, for presenting and for everybody who's attending. And we just have about a minute um, before the next, which is uh, a short break. Um, hello everyone, I am, uh, I'm Louisa Jones. I'm with ICF, I'm a senior director in our Workforce Innovations and Poverty Solutions Group. And I'm delighted to have all of you join us for this session, Picture This Partnership Through a New Lens Build. I am gonna start, um, it's gonna be broken into two different segments. So we're actually gonna start with a, a, a demo of an OPRE uh, clearinghouse uh, with Diana McCallum from uh, Mathematica. And then we're gonna uh, break into the next session and I'll give you some more instructions on 
what the rest of the session will look like, but I'm going to turn it over to Diana right now. Thanks, Louisa. And I will just go ahead and share my screen. Okay, great. So hi everyone, I'm Diana McCollum and I'm project director of the Pathways to Work Evidence Clearinghouse. And I can imagine that one of the central questions that administrators may think about when they're thinking about employment programs is, you know, finding the interventions that work to move the needle on employment outcomes and in particular in, in the long term. Um, and just thinking about how long can we expect those impacts to last. And in an equally important question as well is thinking about, you know, what's the nature of the partnerships that are involved in, in getting that intervention implemented? And the, the Pathways Clearinghouse is a website that's designed to address both of those questions and, of course, many more. And so today I'll provide some guidance from the Pathways Clearinghouse that'll help you think through those particular questions and find interventions that have longer term impacts for clients and then also help you think about how you can find information about um, the partnerships that are involved. So um, this is the website for the Pathways Clearinghouse, pathwaystowork.acf.hhs.gov. And the Pathways Clearinghouse is a systematic review that applies rigorous standards to assess the quality of research on employment focused interventions, um, and particularly for, for individuals with low incomes. Um, and it's a resource that's really designed to help service providers find interventions that have had impacts on four key outcome domains. So employment, earnings, education and training, and public benefit receipt. And across each of those outcome domains, we specifically identify whether there are impacts in the short term, which is 18 months or less, or long term, which is between 18 months and, and five years, and very long term, uh, which is five, uh, five years or longer. Okay. So I'll just jump in and provide you with a quick demonstration of how you can use the website to find that information. So you'd start out by uh, navigating to the home page, of course, and then using this Find Interventions That Work tool. So once you're here, um, you'll see on the left-hand side, there are important filters that you can look at when you're thinking about the particular outcomes you might be interested in. Um, you can also use filters to think about the populations you might be interested in serving, or um, if you have particular services in mind that you want to focus on. But for the purpose of, of this demonstration, just focusing us a bit on thinking about the long-term outcomes, I'll um, use this outcome filter and we'll select um, earnings and, and employment and focus on really those long-term and very long-term outcomes. So you'll see here about 175 interventions. Once I select apply from the filters, that actually brings this list down to 43. And what you're seeing here is that there are 43 interventions with evidence that they improve the selected outcomes we were interested in. So um, you know, thinking about employment and earnings in the long term and very long term. Um, and as you start to think about like how you'd begin to sort through these interventions, they appear alphabetically at first, but um, you might want to sort them by important um, aspects of the outcomes that are important to you, like the size of a particular increase. So let's focus on the size of increase in, in earnings. And if you do that, that's really going to sort the interventions by those that have had the greatest um, uh, increase in earnings and those will appear first. So one thing you, you might want to do as you start to look through each of the interventions is to think about how they compare with one another. Um, so you might you can look at each intervention individually, but I'll just show quickly. You can also get like a snapshot view of all of the interventions in a side by side manner. Um, so I hit that compare selected button to bring this up. And this shows um, you know, a brief uh, snapshot of the different interventions, their goals and the services provided. But I want to draw your attention to this table that shows the ratings and effects in 2018 dollars and percentages. So again, in thinking about, you know, finding those interventions that have long term impacts, you can look at this table and you see for Project Quest, for example, um, this intervention had an increase in earnings of 4400 a year for um, program participants compared to participants that were in the comparison group. Okay, and you can see similar information across the other um, interventions. 
So that's just one thing I wanted to highlight. And you can see that, of course, across the different outcome domains as well. So I want to just move us along and help us think about um, uh, partnerships as well and what information Pathways has on that. So let's look at Transitions SF uh, for an example. And um, you can find out information here about, you know, the goals of the intervention, um, similar information, but this is more extended about the specific effects of the intervention. But there's also detail, what we call implementation details, and we include this information for those interventions that have had a, a favorable um, impact on one of those outcome domains of interest. And you can find information about the organizations implementing the intervention, for example. Um, of course, there's other implementation details, but I just want to draw your attention to this other piece on partnerships um, and thinking about you know, in addition to thinking about each of the organizations, like actually getting detailed information about what, how the organizations work together and the specific services that they provided. So that's all included here on the implementation details. And before I, I end, I just want to highlight some very high level, uh, just provide a high level sense of some information. Again, just going back to this idea of finding those interventions that have, um, you know, improved earnings or employment in the long term. And out of the 175 interventions um, and about 245 studies that are underlying those, we know that there are 43 interventions that have had a favorable impact on, on uh, employment or earnings in the, the long term or very long term. And you can navigate the site to find out sort of what's the size of those uh, impacts. Um, and doing that and looking at the interventions closely, you'll see information such as, you know, there are five interventions that demonstrate an annual increase on earnings. That's about $3,500 or more for intervention participants compared to comparison participants. Um, and sort of at the other extreme, there's about five interventions that increase earnings, but it's about, uh, it's less than a thousand per year. Um, and then if you think about very long-term outcomes, there are about three interventions that show very sustained um, uh, impacts. Um, one intervention, that's my timer, so for one intervention, it's about 4,800 per year. So I'll pause there for the purposes of the demo and we'll come back and I'll talk a little bit more about partnerships. Wonderful, thank you, Diana. Um, so I am, I'm going to move us into um, the rest of the panel. I'm going to just quickly introduce the rest of the panel and um, tell you about our additional panel member who you've never had before on at a TANF, one of our TANF meetings. Um, so we have Diana who's going to um, jump into our panel conversation around collaboration and partnerships. Um, and then we're going to have Baz Roberts, uh, who's the director of the Community Services Division in Washington State. Um, we also have Tiki Brown, uh, who's the Director of Economic Opportunity and Nutrition Assistance at the Minnesota Department of Human Services. And then we also have Jessica Santos, who's the Director of Community Engagement and Research uh, at the Institute for Economic and Racial Equity at Brandeis University. And last but not least, who you will see um, in your gallery um, is Sarah O'Keefe, who is a graphic artist um, at the Center for Public Partnerships and Research at the University of Kansas. So what's going to make this panel unique is that um, uh, all of our panelists are going to be sharing for about eight, min um, about eight minutes each about the importance of partnerships and collaboration within their different agencies and organizations. At the same time, you can choose to uh, pin um, in the gallery um, Sarah's, uh, if you can see her, Sarah O'Keefe, um, she will actually be live drawing and illustrating um, as we go um, all the different kind of um, bits and pieces that our panelists have to share. Um, it, it was a very fun activity the first time. Um, we do realize some people don't necessarily want to see the visual kind of growing um, as they kind of listen to the different uh, participants. So you can either choose to go up to the right hand corner. It may be view or um, three dots, it kind of depends on your Zoom settings, um, and you can actually pin Sarah if you would like to, or you might just be able to just see her kind of in your gallery view, um, depending on what uh, kind of what your preference is for um, kind of seeing it as you're also uh, looking at the um, individual panelists. So, um, and she has a brand new tool that she's using this time around. Uh, so uh, we're excited to kind of see how this works. 
So without further ado, I'm going to have Diana kind of jump in and talk to us um, just for a few minutes about your thoughts around partnership and collaboration and things that um, your uh, peers would like to um, take away from this. Sure. Thanks, Louisa. Um, so as I closed with the, the demonstration, I was showing you how you can find uh, implementation information and specifically thinking about the organizations that were implementing the intervention and, and also partnerships. Um, so you can see that on a given page on the Pathways Clearinghouse for those interventions that have had a favorable impact on one of the key outcome domains of interest. We provide that broader set of um, implementation information. And I think if you use one example, like the I started to show the Transitions SF um, intervention as an example, um, that's an intervention that, you know, its goal was uh, supporting unemployed and underemployed non-custodial parents and finding and maintaining work. Um, but as you start to really examine the details for that um, intervention, you'll see that there are really a tremendous number of organizations involved in implementing that intervention. And um, we, we've taken care within our, our information about implementation to really describe what those different partnerships look like. So of course you can see this on the website, but I'll just give a, a sense of what that looks like for this particular intervention. So it was run by the San Francisco Mayor's Office of Economic and Workforce Development. And then there were additional partners that were involved to recruit participants and provide services. Um, the city and county of San Francisco's Department of Child Support Services recruited and provided child support incentives for participants. Um, the Goodwill of San Francisco uh, was involved in, in providing actual program services. And there were a number of partners, um, charter schools providing GED prep, a mental health treatment facility um, at the family services agencies um, and, and that uh, participated to help manage different substance abuse challenges. And so uh, this just paints a, an initial picture, but we include all of that information so that as, as uh, employment service providers are going to the website, they can get a very clear vision of, you know, the intervention and, and its effects, but also the, uh, the um, organizations that were involved in implementing it and the extent of the different partnerships involved. So this just gives us a brief insight into the role of partnerships. And again, this, this information is available for interventions that show what we call a supported outcome rating or sort of favorable impacts on one of those key outcome domains. But that's behind multiple interventions on the website and you can start to unpack those as you think about different interventions. Um, but I'll, I'll close there and folks, can feel free to email me or email pathwaysclearinghouse at mathematica-mpr.com if you have additional questions as you explore the site. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Diana. Um, we are now going to jump to Babs Roberts to talk to us about- yes, Good morning. Um, well, it's morning for me, probably afternoon <laughs> for all of you. <laughs> um, so I, I was just going to talk through a little bit about how We've been looking at partnerships um, through this sort of new lens uh, for a while. Um, as a human service agency whose mission is to transform lives and whose goal is to reduce poverty, and in Washington State, we have a goal to reduce poverty by 50% by 2025 in a way that eliminates disparities. And that's a huge, audacious goal. Um, and, and having that goal, we had to also recognize that we couldn't do it ourselves. We're not gonna hit that goal all by ourselves. Um, so we know that partnering and partnerships are really important to reaching that goal and important to how we do our work. Um, so the other piece of that is developing those partnerships and then maintaining them in a really vital and useful way. And that can sometimes be a little bit difficult. As, we, I th I th as I thought about this in doing this presentation, there's four sort of key concepts that I think make um, successful partnerships work. Um, and I'm gonna talk about each of those, but essentially uh, inception or development, um, how you define common goals, what's the mutual benefit, and then the one that I think is really most important is shared power. Um, so in, when you talk about inception of a partnership, it's the why and the how are you bringing these partnerships together? Um, and, and how are you creating a foundation 
um, with that partnership? What's the foundation? Being able to clearly articulate purpose and outcome, the why of this conversation, it's really vital, um, I believe, to success because then everybody understands why they're there. Why am I in the room? Um, partnerships can be developed for lots of reasons. Maybe it's executive order, maybe it's legislative mandate, or maybe it's just naturally organic partnerships because you want to get the work done and you need people to help. Um, but knowing why you're in that room and partnering with those folks is really, really important. Um, so I'm, as an example, Washington has a couple of groups. Uh, we've had TNF leadership across a multitude of agencies in Washington state since the inception of TNF, and we call it our workforce leadership. Workforce is our um, employment and training portion of TNF. Um, and that was set up at the governor's direction, ultimately moved to legislative direction, but the partnership was the piece that was vital, and it's more than 25 years old now. It works for us. Um, and we've had other partnerships that have been really um, impactful and important. And the most recent is our Governor's Poverty Reduction Work Group, which was executive order and, and directed um, a huge body of people to come together, develop a 10-year plan, and then move it forward. So knowing the why in those groups, I think was really important, especially that TNF leadership group. It, the implementation of this program Workforce programs in our state really required that partnership to come together. The second idea that I wanted to talk about is this idea of common goals. Identifying, ideally with the entire group's um, input, but identifying the goals of the partnership will increase the buy-in from everybody that's involved, um, especially if you're clearly articulating what the, what the expectation is. When they can see how they contribute to that shared goal, they're more likely to come into that work engaged and ready to move forward. This was really true for Washington in our Governor's Poverty Reduction Work Group that recently, just in the last couple of months, submitted a 10-year strategic plan to the governor about how to meaningfully reduce poverty in Washington state. This was 45 of our closest friends and neighbors, so everything from you know, seven or eight state agencies to uh, community-based organizations, workforce systems, uh, community college systems, um, and just stakeholders um, and advocate groups, but then also included a steering committee um, of uh, people living uh, in poverty, 22 folks who are right now experiencing poverty and using the system. That group spent three years developing that plan and stayed fairly whole through the process of that and is still right now committed to implementing that plan. And a large part of that is because we continue to come back again and again to what was the goal. How, why are we in the room, even when we were struggling to, to collaborate? The third concept is mutual benefit. So a successful partnership really understands and leverages the benefit to all partners. There's some give and take there, right? Everybody has a little bit of skin in the game, something to get out of this, this partnership that, that really meets their own organization's mission and, um, and realizes that they are necessary to reach that larger common goal. I'm going to humbly say that Washington has one of the best SNAP ENT programs in the country. Um, all right, not so humble. But <laughs> um, and from the very beginning of that partnership, more than, oh my gosh, 15 years ago, um, was the idea that everybody had some skin in the game. By leveraging the 50-50 match funding under USDA, we were asking people to not only take the federal funds we were passing through, but put some skin in the game. But most importantly, we were partnering with people who are already doing this kind of employment and training work with low-income individuals. Um, so we were going to people who are already there. They're already, this is part of their goal. This is part of their mission. So it was really helpful to identify really early on the state benefits in that we're getting um, staff recipients, especially AVONs, able-bodied adults without dependents, into work um, or employment and training programs. And community-based organizations, community colleges, et cetera, are benefiting because these are the people they're already serving and they're getting some additional funding to do it. And then finally, I wanted to just talk quickly about shared power. Um, it, and this one's really important, I think, for me in particular to, to have discovered after 30 years of bureaucracy, a bureaucrat, being a 30-year bureaucrat, that there's a real difference between a contractual relationship where one organization has the sort of power in that in that, in that we won't pay you if you don't do kind of thing. Um, and a partnership, a real meaningful partnership where you actually have some give and take, some mutual benefits, some common goals. Um, 
and where you can really determine that everybody's voice is heard and valued. And that's when there's shared, um, shared power. Across all of the partnerships that I've spoken about in um, these few minutes, that was one of the key concepts, that there was shared power. Um, in our workforce leadership, while the TANA funding comes into my agency, the four other agencies involved in this work have an equal level of power in how the decisions about spending the TANF block grant are made and the programming that goes into um, helping, helping people. In the poverty reduction work group, as I talked about, there was shared power not only amongst um, those 45 uh, entities in the room, but in particular, we gave over power to the steering committee um, of uh, uh, people living in poverty by allowing them to not only have their voice heard in terms of solutions, but also in terms of um, giving them the power to say, this goes in the report to the governor, this does not. They were the final say. So sharing power really made that a more meaningful exercise for us. Um, so I think that, I'm um, not sure where I am time-wise, but those were the ideas that, that we're exploring in Washington around partnerships. Wonderful. Thank you, Babs. Um, we'll come back to that power uh, follow-up with some more questions around that. Um, we're next going to go to Tiki Brown in Minnesota. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, so I uh, occupy a similar space as, as Babs um, in Minnesota. I uh, oversee the SNAP program, employment and training, um, some of our food and nutrition programs with food shelves and food banks and, and community action. And so I thought what I would share with you today is, um, you know, some perspectives from some of my work around collaboration and, and partnership. Um, so my first example is um, one with our governor's office. So at the, at the height of the pandemic, or actually at the very beginning of the pandemic, feels like we've been in, in pandemic land for a long time time. But at the beginning of the pandemic, our governor's office pulled together a series of work groups that involved different state agencies so that we could come together, share information about what we were doing, who we, who we were reaching, and then um, take time and space to really identify gaps in services. And so I'm part of one that's um, called the Food Security Work Group. And as a result of our continued meetings, um, as a result of our ongoing um, reports that we were providing to the governor's office, we really were able to respond really quickly when federal funds um, were distributed to different states and when our legislature had funds that they had designated for the purposes of, of low-income individuals. And so due to our shared identifying of goals, um, we were able to distribute about $93 million um, into gaps that we had identified by, by sort of our collaborative uh, partnership work. And then we've been able to sustain that as well. So as um, you know, the pandemic work has sort of ebbed and flowed, we've looked into other ways that we can continue our partnership. So for example, um, between SNAP and WIC, we have um, put together a data sharing agreement so that we can both work on joint outreach um, to our, um, you know, individuals in our inner state who likely would benefit from both of our programs. Um, and I think one key piece of this, um, you know, obviously it's important to have leadership support, um, you know, with the governor's name behind it, everybody was very committed to come together, but they also embedded a number of things that kept the work group moving forward. We had in, you know, in the early days, daily updates. I don't recommend those, that's not great, but it did actually help um, establish some common groundwork and, and framework for where we were at. Um, and then we had weekly meetings, now we're at monthly meetings, but all of those ongoing um, commitment of time and effort really helped um, keep this work moving. And then on the governor's side, the governor and lieutenant governor received weekly updates uh, um, from the work groups. And so that um, embedded accountability into that system to ensure that, um, and I think we've all been part of work groups where, you know, slowly uh, participation drops off. But with that accountability built in, 
everybody was really committed um, and remains committed to this day. Um, so within state, the state agency, I wanted to highlight an example um, that I think is important around collaboration, and that really touches on communication. Um, so we have within our state agency a commitment to align our cash and SNAP programs. And so we do that in a number of ways and for a number of reasons. Um, you all you know, would recognize that you know, from a policy perspective, it's important to be aligned so that you can identify you know, differences, ways that programs, um, uh, you know, work, can work together. It's easier for our workers if, if we're really clear about um, the alignments or, or lack of alignment between different programs. And then, of course, from the client perspective, um, you know, reducing any confusion that, that um, you know, different programs, being on different programs can cause. So we've really been um, thoughtful about how are we communicating our alignment and so we've developed a number of charts um, and documents to help illustrate some of that alignment some of which came in um, of great importance during the pandemic when so many things were changing between different programs and so being able to share um, some of our common goals within the agency externally um, I think was very very important that communication aspect and then we also co-host joint meetings and so we started this during the pandemic as well but and but we'll continue we host weekly meetings with our snap and our um we have mfib the minnesota family investment program is what we call our tanf program in minnesota um but we co-host weekly meetings that are attended by about seven to eight hundred eligibility staff to provide information and share um uh, both our alignment efforts and then just ongoing information. And so uh, communication, I always say, is the hardest and the easiest thing, but I think it just really requires um, some intentional efforts to ensure that um, there is that, that coordinated effort and, and, um, and shared, shared information, information sharing, really. The final piece I'll touch on is really around equity. Um, Babs was mentioning, you know, some of that, that idea of shared power, and I think it's a really important piece and where, where possible, I think the other component of that is just embedding equity in that, in that process. And so, um, as we're sharing power, just thinking about ways that we are generating solutions, making decisions with uh, folks, whether it be community members, um, different communities that make up our populations that we're serving or our, um, or our partnership to make sure that um, they're at the table, right? That we have, um, it's not an afterthought, it's just really embedded in the very structure of how we set up our collaboration efforts to ensure that um, everybody starts at the same spot. You're not adding in people later if you can help it um, and that it is um, just an intentional effort from the, from the very beginning. I think that's so important. Another way that we've embedded equity within the state agency is um, the development of equity briefs. So really focusing in on um, looking at our policies, really determining what are the impacts it has on all of our participants. So looking at different racial groups and determining um, what are the inequities that we are seeing um, from a policy perspective and then using that uh, data and using those briefs to really help implement changes within within our programs. And so um, that again is an intentional effort to embed efforts so that again, it's not afterthoughts. It's not ideally right. You're not um, making these changes or, or thinking about um, these after something new has been developed, but it's it's just part of your your ongoing effort and your process so that there is um, better outcomes and then ultimately um, better collaboration and coordination for all of our programs. So I think with that, I will uh, pause and let the next presentation begin. Thank, Thank you. Tiki. Um, and now we're gonna go to Jessica Santos. Hi everyone, it's great to be here. I'm Jessica Santos, I'm the Director of Community Engaged Research um, at the Institute on Economic and Racial Equity at Brandeis where we conduct research and evaluation in partnership with 
policy organizations and practitioners to um, advance economic and racial equity. So I'm going to talk from the research community partnership perspective, which is very similar to a lot of what has already been said, and I'll lift some of those similarities up um, where it makes sense. And so what we do at first is when we're establishing a research community partnership, we look for existing shared values and goals and try to see if the questions that practitioners and policymakers want to ask align with many of the research questions that we also want to be working on. And so for us, that's economic and racial equity that covers a lot of ground. <laughs> um, and so the partnership that I'm going to be speaking about was a four year partnership with a health profession opportunity grant um, implementation site in Connecticut, where um, Bridgeport, Connecticut, um, hundreds of people were going through training and employment services to enter and advance in the healthcare sector. And the HPOG initiative is a federally funded initiative that's been happening since uh, the Affordable Care Act 2010 to really advance um, or fill in demand job, you know, holes in the labor market while also providing pathways to economic security for low wage workers and for low income women, predominantly women of color, who tend to be overrepresented in low wage um, positions in healthcare. So we came to the partnership in Bridgeport with a motivation to understand why women of color were um, stuck in entry level jobs and were not benefiting from career advancement programs to the extent that we saw other other um, populations. Because if you look at the labor market distribution, the occupational segregation between jobs and also within the sector, um, between and within sectors is clear. So how, how is it that um, career pathways programs with millions of dollars invested from the federal government aren't uh, sort of solving that occupational segregation question. And the workforce partner had questions just about how can we improve our programs to enhance uh, economic self-sufficiency for our participants as well as job quality. So the shared goals and, and motivations were already there. Um, it was an easy alignment from the beginning, but we still spent about probably six months um, getting to know our partners and actually interviewing staff and many of the program partners to understand what really motivates them. And what we found was, um, and this I think is, resonates with a lot of workforce development professionals, we found a real desire to motivate low income and low wage workers to advance in their own lives. They had a motivational mindset that, and, and then either like explicit or implicit belief in the bootstraps narrative that if you really can find the right job training program, the right combination of motivation and skills that you can advance. What we were finding from the previous round of HPOG as well as kind of the initial review of data from Connecticut was that it was the opposite, that many of the participants were extremely motivated and working really hard and getting additional stackable credentials, but were not actually moving up or finding, um, maybe they would move from a $12 an hour job to a $12.50 an hour job, but that's not the type of advancement that collectively we all would like to see that would lead to economic self-sufficiency. So the second kind of point that I'll emphasize today is, is trust. We had to bring some really hard truths to our partners. Um, after we conducted individual interviews with participants, we wanted to lift up the participant experience and voice and compare the experience of Connecticut participants to national data. And we did find that, you know, people were really staying stuck in low wage jobs in the Bridgeport area. And we had to bring that to the program, despite the fact that they were doing an incredible job implementing the program, the outcomes were just not where we would all like them to be. So having established the fact that we all share the same goal of, of economic security and mobility, then bringing that hard truth is easier by saying, listen, we all know that we have to hear the hard truths if we want to actually achieve our goals. Um, and so what that did is, is launch the next phase of our partnership research work, which was to develop a curriculum and model it after a totally different model, not the traditional career pathways model where we have, um, you know, a, a, usually a white man moving up a ladder sequentially and quickly over the course of his lifetime. That's kind of what the career pathways model is designed over. 
around instead. And if you see the graphic that, um, that Louisa posted, you'll see the visual representation of what I'm saying. Instead, the reality of what we were looking at were predominantly black women moving along a very zigzag path encountering different barriers along the way and making small what we call micro advancements along that path which are not as as well captured in um, either workforce development designed programs or the outcomes that are tracked so nationally after a four-year investment of the first round of hpog 85 percent of participants had had actually gotten into the healthcare sector so this program from a national perspective is effective at getting people into the sector 85% had either completed one training or got one job. It wasn't as successful at moving people up. So only 15% of participants from that first round had gotten a second credential or a second job. So it's that latter piece that we need to really be looking at. Um, the third piece that I wanna reemphasize, which has been spoken about a lot today is equitable relationships or what Babs called shared power because when we come in as academic researchers, we are very clear that we have one form of knowledge, but everybody who we're partnering has equally valuable forms of knowledge. Um, so lived experience, incorporating the voices of participants, um, the staff have incredible form, you know, amounts of knowledge about how the, the system works. And then, um, and then co-developing, like having a commitment to co-learning together. Right, we're not saying we're going to develop knowledge and tell you what it is or vice versa. We're saying we're all collectively developing, raising up some new themes and knowledge and then reflecting together on it. So the last point I'll, I'll say is um, I think, I think reflective capacity in partnerships is really important. And I would even love to see that built into some research community partnership design grants or something because like often we complete the whole project manage to write the final report by the time the grant is over but then there's like i wish there was like another six months in which the research and partner team could really work through the lessons and make sense of them and be able to truly incorporate them into changes to the program or to policies in a kind of quality improvement mind you know approach so i'll stop there thank you thank you jessica so i am I'm going to ask a few um, different questions and um, and Sarah, thank you for continuing to capture everything as we're talking here. Um, uh, it's I know it's it's kind of a different way to kind of capture some of these key key lessons as all of our panelists are talking. So, um, Diana, um, I wanted to kind of ask you in terms of uh, some of this implementation piece. Uh, do all organizations kind of you know, have a, a clear understanding of really where they sit within the process, um, or do they kind of get that um, made more clear for them with this, um, you know, with some of this uh, work on the clearinghouse? Do they better understand their roles once they kind of see the process? talking while I'm mute. Louisa, <laughs> when you were speaking, I think I missed a key word. Did you say dual organizations sort of well, have a sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, like with the ones that have a lot of organizations kind of involved. And so I think that goes back to kind of having um, what Baz was referring to is kind of, you know, what role do people play? Do, do you think that they all have a, a, a good sense of really where they are in that process? Or do you think with this um, kind of mapping that it helps them kind of really understand where they are in the implementation process? Yeah, it's it's a good question. And I'll, I'll start off with, I don't think the Pathways Clearinghouse can necessarily answer that and that, you know, the, the Clearinghouse is really set up to provide information on sort of what the partnerships are, but may not tease out the aspects of like what goes into making it mm -hmm. successful. But, um, you know, just what I'm gathering from the other expert panelists, is, like you said, I would defer to, to them. But I think, mm -hmm. you know, like having a, a, a clear theory of action and thinking about collectively the outcomes you want to impact for clients that is, is certainly come up as something that is is probably an essential part of the process um, Babs really started talking about the why and setting up goals together and I think we heard this echoed with um, uh, Tiki as well as she talked mm -hmm. about like the ongoing commitment um, of time and effort that's involved 
Um, so I think those are all important uh, elements. Um, and I, I think like one of the one of the helpful things I heard emphasized, and again, you know, I think it, you may see this really highlighted. Maybe uh, a more this this may be a, an important gap in sort of what we know about the implementation work, but um, the extent to which you know um, the these partnerships form, or sort of what is involved, um, whether it's having weekly group meetings to to flesh out the theory of action and think about the goal. I I do think that's a gap, and and that we may not see as much information on that, but these sound like glimpses of what could really be helpful. Thank you, Brian. Um, building, building on that with, with the why, um, Babs, um, I asked a similar question last time, but you kind of really brought up why people are at the, um, at the table. And, you know, just like a, a long a marriage, um, 25 years is a long time for some of these partnerships. How do you keep people fresh on why they are there? That's a, it's a really great question, especially that long-term partnership. Um, and I think it's just revisit the why, right? Just continue to understand why the, the partnership is important. Obviously over that 25 years, we've had changes in the leadership structure of each of the agencies and organizations involved, but the core value of why we're there, why the partnership exists, um, it's just reiterated on a consistent basis. We go back and intentionally talk about why, why are we here? What do we want, hope to gain? And what is the value not only for um, your agency, but what is the value that each partner brings to the people that we're trying to serve? Thank you. Um, and a tiki Building on that, in terms of communication, can you talk a little bit more um, about how that communication happens? You, you know, you've got newsletters, you've got emails, you've got conference calls, et cetera, but how do you really kind of get all these different state and local agencies kind of on the same page of what the goal is? Yeah, that has been a challenge, I think. Um, you know, oftentimes, with the, with the food security work group, we've been lucky in that we have an assigned staff person, actually two, one that leads the work and then kind of a behind the scenes, you know, note collector. So it makes it really easy to participate and really easy to go back and look at, you know, decisions that were made or information that was shared because it's all collected and shared in a, in a SharePoint site that everybody can access. And so we have had, um, I think, you know, I've seen, I've been involved in a lot of different work groups throughout my career. And sometimes what happens and where the communication starts to break down is when there isn't a clear lead or a clearly identified um, person that that's a responsibility. It doesn't necessarily work when it's everybody's role to do, you know, a section of it and it's, and it, it can become really disjointed. So we've had great success in having one key person that kind of helps manage it. And then um, we each collectively take that piece and bring it back through our own communication processes, right? Which need to happen. But um, the core of it is um, our core talking points and our, our core language is, 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 is from one person. That's. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, Jessica, um, so, you know, sometimes we all think in terms of how can we make participants kind of understand more about what, how they can advance, et cetera. And it sounds like a lot of these programs give them the knowledge, give them the initial steps and that you're seeing that happen, but it's not happening that they keep moving up. What can organizations, agencies, and the general systems that we all live and work in do to actually make that easier? Yeah, great question. I think um, there's a couple of things. One is to really examine the, the real outcomes that we're seeing um, in our own programs. I think taking that, um, you know, our partner was very open to learning about the fact that, oh wait, the participants aren't actually kind of moving from a CNA to an RN the way we all wish that they were. <laughs> and so that's not a shortcoming of theirs. Maybe it's something else is going on. And so 
reworking the narrative within your own program so that it matches the reality. So why are, why are people stuck in low quality jobs? Because there aren't actual articulated ladders in healthcare the way we really want them to be. So then some of the energy of the organization can go to partnering with employers to articulate those ladders in a, in a, in a clearer sense at the local level and develop real pathways. That's just one example. I think the occupational segregation one is another one. So a hard look at the realities of racial segregation in the workforce is necessary at this stage in all sectors, but especially in healthcare, um, especially after the year we've had. So acknowledging, I love the idea um, that Tiki, you know, embedding equity in everything, but also having equity audits or equity briefs, having organizations take on that responsibility to understand what are the inequities that are getting perpetuated in a program that, and how can the program design prevent that, prevent the magnification of existing inequities and instead reduce them. So I think some of that reflective capacity around inequities and then a commitment to program design that really reflects our reality today um, is the shift that I'm hoping for. That's great. Thank you. Um, and um, then one last question, and this is kind of unfair because all of you are talking about your organizations and kind of cross agency relationships, but for those listening today who want to kind of make small changes, whether it be kind of individual and just in their department, perhaps just in maybe some of the ways that they're shaping and thinking about small initiatives within the department or, or across agencies, what are some just initial steps that uh, they can even take to get started? That's for everybody. I can share. This is Tiki. One thing, um, one of the ways that we started um, taking steps towards action in um, my agency is with our contracts. So we recognized that we did not have information, um, as much information as we wanted in terms of um, who, who, who our contractors were and for example, who was on their board, who was on their leadership team, to really determine um, were they reflective of the population that they were serving. And so we, we, we have sort of a five-year plan, but our first step was just asking questions in our, in our RFPs so that we could start collecting that data. And then our plan is, you know, in future years to actually embed questions and actually, you know, divert some of our contracts to people that actually um, are reflective of the, the organizations are reflective of the populations that they're serving because that's a, that's a, that's a goal of ours. So this, so some of the steps are super small in terms of you just might need to capture data and collect data so that you have more information that you can make um, better action steps. I can also weigh in there. I think I would agree um, on using, utilize, think, thinking about and tracking how you're utilizing resources. And we also do this within our own organization. We're a research institute, but how, who are we contracting with or partnering with and who benefits from participating in the research? Or, and so the value on our side of equitable relationships also includes equitable funding relationships. So we often raise money and ensure that um, the organizations, staff and participants that we partner with are financially compensated for the work they're doing in the co-research process. This is Diana. If I could add one other small thought, I like this idea of like thinking of small changes that you might wanna implement and I think the Pathways Clearinghouse could be another helpful resource for that too. Um, I kind of showed how you might look at different outcomes you want to improve, but you can also look across services that other interventions have provided. So if you wanted to look at something like supportive services and just to find the interventions that have at least included supportive services, if you're thinking of implementing a few, um, that at least will give you a sense of the interventions that have been tested and, and included supportive services, and you can find out a little bit more about how they did that. So, um, you know, not necessarily telling you whether that piece is effective, but it'll give you a broader sense of, you know, if you're looking for small changes, just thinking about what else is out there. And I, I will say in the future, we'll have some products that do 
point you more in the direction of, you know, understanding where there's evidence behind a specific set of, of services. And we'll, we'll be doing more of that synthesis in the future. But I definitely think that's something that people can come to the website and start to look at now. That's wonderful. Thank you, Diane. Babs, do you want I mean, to? I, oh, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I actually wanted to build on something Jessica and Tiki had started to talk about. Um, and the idea, for instance, of a core lead, uh, I think Tiki is such an important concept. But, um, but one of the places that I think made our poverty reduction work as successful as it was, is that not only did we have a, somebody who was the core lead, keep the momentum going, get everything set up, but that that person's um, role was also, regardless of the fact that they worked for our agency was also to be sort of independent and uh, unbiased in their skill, right? That their part of their role was to be that independent, unbiased, unencumbered person who could hear all the voices in a really meaningful way. Um, so, so the lead role is really important, but that person needs to be able to take on a facilitator hat and set aside their sort of own organizational connections. Um, and that's a really difficult thing to do, and it requires the, lead, the leading agency to be able to sort of know that that's necessary and move away from the traditional state agency, executive branch, bureauc bureaucratic sort of culture and shift out to how do we just get the work done and it doesn't really matter who's leading. That's great. Thank you, Babs. Um, I want to thank all of our presenters and um, also, Sarah, for the graphic recording, um, what uh, Sarah uh, does is kind of go back and uh, tweak it a little bit and refine it. And what we'll be doing is sharing this with all the participants of each meeting um, as it gets finalized. So um, thank you to all. And I'm going to actually turn this over to Chantal Mickens to, um, uh, from OFA to close us out. Hey everyone, um, I'm Chantel Mickens. I'm the regional program manager for uh, Region 2. Uh, I just want to thank the moderators, Louisa, Shelly, Ed, you guys did a great job. And thank you to all of our presenters. Um, thank you so much for sharing your experiences, your program overviews, and your client stories were great. I really appreciated hearing um, the successes. Um, our agenda emphasized how important it is to make families a priority in our work. And um, the speakers presented ways that have been able to create family-centered services while navigating state and federal requirements, which um, we are fully aware is a very difficult thing to do. Um, hopefully, others can benefit from the ideas presented today. Um, again, thank you all for sharing. Uh, join us on the 22nd of March for the last installment of this virtual event. The topic will be adapting client-centered approaches to a virtual environment. We'll talk about things like uh, responding to trauma and overcoming IT barriers. And um, hopefully we'll be able to provide you with some more valuable information. So for now, everyone stay safe. Enjoy the rest of your week. And hopefully I'll see you all on the 22nd. And please complete the survey before you log off. We'd really appreciate your feedback. Thanks everyone.